we're going to get started. <clears throat> a couple of things, um, and I recognize lots of your faces, um, but just in case this is your first time here at Breadbeckers, um, I want to tell you where the exits are. I don't plan on uh, burning anything down today, but just in case, there is an exit right through the curtains here. There's, of course, the front door. There's also an exit at the end of the building here. And then there's also one in this back corner. Um, bathrooms, that's the second most important thing that you need to know where that is. Um, there is one in the hallway. And then there's also one, there's a brown door right back here that leads to our prep kitchen and there's a bathroom in there that you are welcome to use. Um, there is a water cooler there. We have um, bottled water and all natural sodas in the front that you are welcome to purchase at any point during the class. You are not going to um, disturb me at all if you have to get up and you need to stretch your legs or go to the bathroom or get something out of the store. Don't worry about it. I'm the mother of three. I'm really good at tuning things out. Um, and I've been married 13 years, so I'm really good at tuning things out. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, what is the other thing? Everyone got a handout when you came in? Um, also, did you go ahead and pick up this cookbook and then our red Bread Becker's recipe collection as well? Did we have those out? Um, to, no, we did not have those out. Um, you brought yours from home because you're a smart girl. Very good. Um, no, well, I'll get the I'll get the girls to bring uh, some of the red bread Becker's recipe collections out so that y'all can look in, at the recipes as we make them because we're going to do several out of that um, cookbook as well. Um, let's go ahead and pray and get started, um, and then after we pray, if you're just coming in and you want to come get some oatmeal, I've got some warm um, oatmeal. Uh, with fresh apples and a whiskey cream sauce. And I'll tell you where I got that recipe um, as soon as we pray and get started, all right? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the beautiful weather. Um, I just thank you for this group of ladies that have come this morning ready to learn something new and to extend their uh, bread making adventure. Um, be with us this morning. Help the food to turn out uh, the way that I intend for it to. Help me to speak clearly um, and help everyone to leave here today encouraged and excited and uh, ready to try out new things for their family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, my name is Ashley McCord. I am Brad and Sue Becker's oldest and most wonderful daughter um, and uh, the oldest of the nine. And, um, and then I have three children of my own, ages nine, six, and five, soon to be nine, seven, and six. Uh, both my boys will be having birthdays in the next couple of months. Um, <clears throat> so I have, like I said, I've been married 13 and a half years now uh, to my wonderful husband. And, um, you know, for me, bread making and all of this stuff, it kind of comes naturally. So I'm sorry um, that maybe I, I try to make things as simple as possible for you, but I have been doing this a very long time. Um, in fact, in November um, of this year, uh, 2012, we'll be celebrating 20 years of being in business here at the Bread Beckers. Um, and I won't tell you how old I was when I started because we started because then that will tell you how old I am now. And a girl never tells that. So um, I've been doing this a very, very long time. Um, so I know that sometimes for you guys just starting and getting in, it can be a little overwhelming. And so we try very hard here at the Bread Beckers to make it as easy and simple as possible um, so that you leave encouraged and ready to, to dive right in. Um, where I came up with the idea for this class, um, I actually did the Bread Making 101 class. Has anybody come to the Bread Making 101 class? Um, have any of you come to the Getting Started class that mom does? Okay, um, the Getting Started class can be a bit overwhelming because it's really long and it's a lot of information, but it's one of those things where we, um, we don't know what to cut out um, because we want you to know everything. Um, and we don't want you to go home and go, oh, why didn't you tell me that? Or I was ready to do this recipe and I didn't know that I could. And um, so I started the Bread Making 101 class to try and scale down and kind of simplify um, the Getting Started class. Well, then it kind of left us where, well, where do we go from there? Um, and so I decided to start this Bread Making 201 class with the hopes that you're kind of, okay, you've got the muffins down. 
right? Yes, we've got the muffins down. That's an easy recipe. Um, we're, we've pretty much got our bread down. You know, we can make our sandwich bread for our, our family. If you're still having trouble with that, we'll talk after the class and we'll get it figured out. I, I have every confidence that we can help you figure that out. Um, you're making the pancakes, you're making the, the, you know, that sort of thing. Where is it that your family is still tempted to eat out? Or, you know, are you still ordering pizza because you haven't perfected pizza yet for your family? Or does your family really like Mexican, but you haven't started doing the tortillas yet, so you're still eating out or buying white flour tortillas? Or, like in my case, you've got birthday parties coming up. Now what do you do? Now that you've totally thrown away all the white flour and white sugar out of your house, right? Yes. You have thrown away all the white flour and all the white sugar out of your house. Now what are you supposed to do? And heaven forbid you go to the store and order a birthday cake. Cool. Um, no. No. So where does that leave you? And we've got the holidays coming up, which is always fun and exciting. Um, and you want, you want to pull out some of those old family favorite recipes, but you don't know how to convert them now using your new ingredients. So that was the basis for me putting together this class. So... If I don't cover something that you have a question about, then just just ask. Um, you know, like I said, I'm I'm used to being talked to while I'm I'm working incessantly. Mommy, 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 mom. So you guys ask questions, and we'll just we'll just plow through and keep going. If something doesn't make sense, definitely stop me. Um, and if I've said something backwards. Julie, Julie will know. She comes to all the classes. So she'll know if I say something totally wrong because she'll be like, um, hello, no, <laughs> you're having a total moment today. Um, so we are going to start with um, birthday cake. So if you'll take that 2007 holiday recipe collection. <clears throat> Back in 2004, we actually um, decided to have a recipe contest. Um, we had so many customers that were calling us and saying, um, oh, I've tried this new recipe, or oh, I've created this new recipe, and um, we were very excited about that, and so we had a recipe contest in 2004. Well, then mom got sick, um, and so we had to skip a couple of years of having the contest, and so then we ended up having it in 2007, so then since we started the whole every three years thing, we kind of had to stick with it, so uh, then we did it again in 2010. These are fantastic cookbooks because they are customer-tested recipes. Um, they're tried and true recipes. We did test a lot of them here in our test kitchen before we made the cookbook, so we have tried them as well. Um, if you ask us which one is the best, we all have favorite recipes out of each one. So it's definitely, they are definitely something that you will want to eventually own the 2004, the 2007, and the 2010. But the 2007 was my favorite for a long time because of this cake recipe. Um, if you've come to any of the classes that I teach, you have probably heard me talk about my daughter, Catherine. She is nine and she has a pretty severe milk allergy um, and so cakes and cookies and things like that were kind of um, hard for us in the very beginning when she was little um, and I remember the day that one of the ladies that worked here Denise she called me at home and she said you are not gonna believe I just tested a recipe for the recipe contest and it is a chocolate cake recipe and it is more moist than a boxed cake mix and it is so good and it has no butter and no milk in it whatsoever. So I was very, very excited about that. So this has become our standard birthday cake recipe. So I'm gonna grab my cookbook and we're gonna get going because we kind of have to do things backwards. We need to make the dessert so that we can eat the dessert at the end. So, because I learned um, my lesson from the very first time I ever did this class. I actually made a cake ahead of time. Well, then we had like two huge cakes left over and I just decided that that was not like the best thing to happen. So, was to have two big old cakes left over. Um, let's see, I need a bowl. All right, so in the recipe, it calls for two cups of soft wheat flour, soft white wheat flour, if you don't know, soft wheat is going to be your pastry wheat. You use hard wheats for all of your yeast breads, um, 
pizza crust, all that kind of stuff. Any recipe that has yeast, you have to have hard wheat, okay? Soft wheat is your pastry wheat. Um, if you come across a recipe of ours that already calls for soft wheat, you, then you just you use it exactly how the recipe says. We'll talk a little bit more later about converting other recipes using the soft wheat. It's a very high moisture um, grain, and so uh, sometimes you have to use a little more flour than your recipe calls for when you're converting it. All right, so we're going to mix our dry ingredients together. We've got our flour and our cocoa. And then I've got my baking soda and my baking powder that I'm going to add in as well. So the recipe says to mix the first four ingredients together, which is our dry ingredients, and set them aside. And now we are going to get our eggs and our soup not going. Um, white sugar and brown sugar are not good for you and so the alternative what we carry are two products called Sucanot which is dehydrated evapor or it's evaporated cane juice so they take the juice of the sugar cane and they just remove the moisture off and you're left with a uh, brown granulated sweetener that you can use one for one in place of brown sugar. Um, it works great in cakes, cookies, whatever you're making. Um, then the substitute for white sugar is a product called, it actually has two names depending on which company it comes from. So you'll probably, you'll see it on our website or in our cookbooks or on our price list. Sometimes you'll see it one way and sometimes you'll see it another. Um, and the two names are Sucanot with honey and honey granules. Okay, so if you see something that calls for sucanot with honey or honey granules, know that that is, it's the same thing, okay? And what that is, it is the juice of the sugar cane. They remove some of the molasses off and then they add a mild honey to it and then they dehydrate it. And you're left with a very light color, light in flavor sweetener that you can use one for one in place of white sugar. Um, so if you wanted to make this cake, and here's my cup and two-thirds of Sucanot. If you wanted to make this into a yellow cake or a white cake, what you would use is you would use the, the honey granules here in place of the Sucanot because it's lighter in color. And then instead of that two-thirds of a cup of cocoa, just increase your soft white wheat flour. So just add and replace the cocoa with a little more flour, okay? And that's how you would make this into a white cake or a yellow cake. This is something new. This is the double whisk bowl attachment to the assistant mixer. Um, but this is something new that they've just started um, putting with this mixer. And it is a single wire whip for the double whisk bowl that allows you to do cakes and cookies now in this. The original whips that came on it are really for egg whites and whipping cream is what that's for. With a cake batter, you don't want to put that much air into it or it ends up falling, okay? So we're gonna use this today. What was that? Um, her question, I'm gonna repeat the question because we're actually uh, filming and live streaming today. Um, her question was, have I tried any egg substitutes or anything like that? I have not in this recipe. So if you try it, let me know how it turns out. All right, we're just gonna let that beat together for a second. I'm gonna wash my hands. <clears throat> now the recipe says um, to grease two round uh, nine inch cake pans. And I'm gonna tell you about some fantastic pans that we have started carrying. This is made by the American Pan Company, uh, or in short, the USA Pan line of bakeware. Um, they are a, an aluminized steel, which means it has an aluminum core, which most pans do have an aluminum core because they're the it's the best conductor of heat. Um, and then it has a steel coating, and then the non-stick layer is a silicone 
Um, but instead of the flimsy silicone, it's actually a finish on the pan. Um, so you don't want to use anything metal that could possibly scratch the finish or anything like that, but they are completely nonstick. The muffin pans are absolutely fantastic. Um, the nine by 13, like a roasting pan, wonderful for cinnamon rolls. I even, I did cinnamon rolls one time and let it, like the pan sat off to the side and got cold. Well, normally that ooey gooey cinnamon roll filling, once it gets cold, it like hardens in whatever pan. All I had to do was take a paper towel and wipe it out. It didn't stick at all. They're wonderful. So I always get really scared though when I do this class that like is something gonna go wrong and is the cake gonna stick this one time while I'm like teaching in front of you. But it hasn't happened yet. So hopefully today won't be that day. So we've got our pans. You don't have to spray them. You don't have to flour them, nothing. Now the biggest trick with cakes, and this is with any pan um, that you use, um, when you're baking a cake, you're going to take it out of the oven, you're gonna let it cool for about 10 minutes, but you don't wanna let it cool too much longer past that because what will happen is the, the cake will sweat and it'll release from the pan, but then if you let it completely cool in the pan, it will actually stick back in the pan. Um, and I have had that come close to happening in these pans. And that would happen in any old nonstick pan. Um, cakes are very, there's that fine line of when you need to dump them out of the pan. So, um, all right, we've got our, our eggs and our, oh, I forgot to grab my vanilla out. Uh-huh. Yes, yes, it does need to release. It sure does. Sharon, I'm gonna need another thing of vanilla. I know, because I've got several things that I'm making with vanilla today. There was exactly one teaspoon. All right. <clears throat> so let this mix for a second. All right, and now here is your, here is your weird ingredient that the first couple of times that I made this, I didn't tell people what was in it, but it's mayonnaise. This is our, um, these are our wonder cups, our one cup wonder cups, great for measuring peanut butter and mayonnaise and, um, and things like that. And I actually measured this yesterday and then just wrapped it with, um, some plastic wrap and stuck it in the fridge so that it was ready for me. What kind of brand do I use of, um, of mayonnaise? Is that what you're asking? Um, I used today whatever mom had in the refrigerator. Um, I think it was, I think today it was Kraft, the olive oil the one made with olive oil. Um, try to, I try to get one that doesn't have any added sugar. Um, so, but you know, whatever, whatever kind you use, you know. I don't, I mean, it is chocolate cake, so I don't get too particular with it, to be honest with you. And this is one of those things where, you know, this is a special treat. This is not, I am not saying make this yummy chocolate cake out of all whole wheat flour and sucanat, and this be your bread consumption every day. That is so not what I'm saying, okay? This is, this is special occasion, special treat, okay? This is not something that you should turn into muffins, which you can totally scoop this into a muffin pan and make cupcakes with it. I have done that many, many times. But don't put it in your muffin pan and then have that, oh, I had my whole grain bread product for the day. Mm, no, that's not gonna cut it. Not gonna cut it. All right, we're gonna turn this down to low and we're gonna mix in our mayonnaise. <clears throat> and then we're gonna get our water ready. And we're gonna start adding our dry ingredients and our water 
a little bit at the time. This is one of those I've had customers ask me many times, why do you go back and forth? Well, number one, that's just how the directions say to do it. I don't really know why the particulars are. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's one of those things where it was probably someone's grandmother's cake recipe that they converted successfully with the whole grain flours and with the sucanat and everything, and that was just the way uh, grandma's recipe read to do it. Kind of like the the roasting pan. Have y'all seen that email, that story that goes around about the husband asks his wife, why do you always cut your pot roast in half before you put it in the pan? And she said, I don't know. That's just the way my mom always did it. So that's the way I do it. And so he asked his mother-in-law one day, why do you cut the pot roast in half? Or maybe the daughter asked her mom, why do you do that? And she said, we always did that because we didn't have a roasting pan big enough to hold the whole roast. So it had nothing to do with baking the roast. It just, it had, I didn't have a pan big enough. So sometimes we do things the, the way our moms did it, but we don't really know why we did it that way. All right, let me just mix this real quick and then I'll get to your question. I'm gonna stop it and stir. All right, what's your question now that I can hear you? If you didn't have soft wheat and all you had was hard white, um, it would probably be a little more fibrous. You might would taste the, a little bit of graininess to it. Um, I would almost recommend using something like rye or spelt um, if you didn't have the soft. Now you may not have rye or spelt either, but um, rye and spelt, oat flour, those grains are very, very high in moisture and they're much softer grains than the hard red and the hard white. And so you could certainly use a combination of those flours if you wanted to. Rye actually does not have a distinct flavor at all. It's caraway seeds that make rye bread taste the way that it does. So rye is an excellent grain for cookies and cakes and things like that. And with the hard white, it would probably be a texture thing that you wouldn't like so much about it. Um, I know spelt and uh, rye, barley, oats, things, they do have distinct flavors to those grains, but if you're doing the chocolate cake version, the cocoa would probably mask the flavor of spelt and you would never, and you would never taste it. Yes, ma'am. If you were gonna use spelt or kamut, no, you, I, would you increase the flour? No, I would not. I would do just the same amount. In fact, you might even find that you need a little more water Add a little more water. You want it to be a loose batter. That's what's going to keep it um, very moist and light and fluffy um, with this recipe in particular. And you'll see when I start to, to pour it out that it's not, do y'all see how runny that is? It's not like a pound cake batter that you spoon in to the pan. Is there ever a reason to sift the flour? Now, sifting the flour does, it would do two things. It would aerate the flour, making it light and fluffy. Um, and then also they were, would sift it to get the fiber, the bran and the germ and all that out so that it was a lighter texture. If you do that, you are totally defeating the purpose of grinding your own wheat. You want all of that fiber and everything. So I have, done very old recipes before that called for sifting it and I did use my sifter but it was more to aerate and also a lot of times a recipe will have you put your baking powder your salt and your baking soda in with the flour and sift it and that way you get everything you don't have any clumps of anything now when I have done that and I've I'm done sifting and I look in my sifter and it's got all of the bran right there I dump it in with the rest of my flour. So I don't actually throw the bran away, but I have sifted before just to aerate. Um, and you would do that mostly if you were going to hand stir a recipe. I would, there's no point in sifting if you're about to mix it in a mixer because 
the whole point in sifting and aerating is because you want to be very gentle if you're folding the batter in. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, that is the cake. So we're going to go ahead and get those baking so that then they have time to completely cool so that we can ice them later. Okay, let me see. 30 to 35 minutes. All right. Does anybody have any other questions about the cake before we move on to icing? Okay. Did y'all see that? If the recipe calls for soft and you use hard wheat, then you're going to need to decrease the flour. Or like I said, with this recipe, you would increase your, add a little bit more water to compensate for that, for that flour, for the dryness of the hard white wheat, the hard wheats. Okay. That is that. Okay. Huh? Yes, thank you for reminding me to set a timer because I forgot. There we go. All right. Now, icing. I know that Sharon, um, Sharon Fiskanen, who's helping serve food today, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, she has done um, an icing that was dairy free using the Earth Balance. Um, butter substitute so if you need a dairy free um, icing then she's the girl to talk to after the class um, the buttercream icing that I'm going to do for you today is just a traditional buttercream icing so no dairy free here this is our mega blend I'm gonna use it to make my powdered sugar today now, we carry, um, here is the honey granules or sucanat with honey that I was telling you guys about earlier. Um, this, is what I'm gonna, this is what I use in place of white sugar. And I'm going to blend it in my blender to make powdered sugar. Um, we do carry the honey granules already in a powdered form. If you wanted to use, if you wanted to purchase that and use it, absolutely go right ahead. I would still probably blend it a little bit more because it's certainly not... 10x powdered sugar, okay? Um, and, the, and I have learned a couple of tricks with using it, but if you wanted to only have, you know, one ingredient sitting in your, in your pantry and, and be able to do both with it, use it one for one in place of white sugar and powder it, um, then the honey granules is the way you want to go. You do not want to put them in your grain mill. It will turn it to glass and it will tear up your whisper mill or your neutral mill. So a blender or a food processor is what you want to use. So I'm just going to turn this on and let this blend up real quick. And the trick that I have learned with this recipe and with using the honey granules or even the sucanat and powdering it like this um, is you're going to let it powder and you're going to add your cream and your butter and your liquid or whatever you're going to add to make it. You're going to let it sit for about 10 or 15 minutes and then blend it again. And that gives the powdered honey granules time to completely dissolve. If you tried to blend it up and use it right away, it would still be very grainy. You need to let it fully dissolve in the, in the butter or the cream. There is not a cup measurement. This was this is my mom's or my grandma's converted buttercream um, icing recipe, and it was a pound of powdered sugar. So just get you a, a good scale. Um, if I ever convince you to um, start making your own pasta, you're going to need a scale there too. So um, just get a, a scale, and I just I measure it out in the bowl. So I put my bowl on my scale, I zero it out, and I weigh out a pound of honey granules because a pound of the honey granules powdered is still a pound. The volume has increased and that's where it can sometimes be hard if you're making your own powdered sugar to say, well, I need five cups of powdered sugar or powdered honey granules. You know, how, how many cups of honey granules do I need to blend up to get that? And then it would depend on how long do you let it blend and, and that sort of thing. 
All right, so we've got and your, butter, your buttercream icing recipe should be in your handout, which I'm going to get my copy of it real quick. Once I get all the ingredients added in there and I mix it up, I let it sit about 10, 15 minutes, and then I re-blend it again. And that way it's had it's a chance to fully dissolve and blend in smooth, okay? Um, and now I've got my butter and my cream cheese. Like I said, this is not an everyday recipe that you need to be eating. Special occasion. I've actually got my son, JJ, he will be seven next Tuesday. And he has a baseball game Monday night. And so since I'm the one who made the snack schedule, which came in handy, um, I'm taking snacks for that game and I'm gonna make the boys um, cupcakes in honor of his birthday and I'm gonna do chocolate with white the white buttercream icing and then I'm going to ice them to look like baseballs on top and put their number each each boy's number on there all right so we've got our pound of honey granules we've got our butter and our cream cheese what happened to that vanilla that you went and grabbed is it did you stick it up here for me thank you Now, you can make chocolate icing here by just adding a couple of tablespoons of cocoa if you wanted a chocolate icing. Um, and then you can also add things like the little honey candies that we sell out at the front, the front counter. We sell a caramel honey candy um, that is really yummy if you melt about five or six of those down and add it to this and make a caramel frosting. It's, it's pretty, pretty yummy. All right, and just a couple of tablespoons of milk. And then we're gonna let this blend up. This mega blend is wonderful for making pie crust and biscuit dough where you have to cut in cold butter because of the blade down in there it does a wonderful job and you really want to use for the icing you want the butter and the cream cheese to be room temperature and i actually set it all out yesterday hoping that it would be nice and soft and the butter was still a little a little firmer than i would normally like it to be but that's because it was so cold in here last night Mm hmm if you don't have this you would just cut it in or a food processor any food processor that has um, a blade like this will work a chopping a chopping blade this is great for uh, smoothies too like if you wanted to do a big batch of smoothies I'm gonna add just a little bit more milk. Okay, and we're just gonna let this sit to the side so that, that the honey granules can get good and dissolved and then we'll, I'll probably, I'll probably just let it sit there while we do the class and then depending on how warm it starts getting up here, I might stick it in the fridge, but, um, and then we'll re-blend it right before we ice the cake, so. All right. Next, we are going to move on to the peach cobbler, um, which I, peaches are kind of not in season right now. So um, I did change this recipe up just a little bit and um, I decided to get um, just some mixed berries. So we're gonna do a mixed berry cobbler is what we're gonna do. Um, but I definitely wanted you to see that you can, be, you can be very creative with this recipe and use whatever kind of fruit you want to use. 
This is a converted recipe from the Food Network. I definitely wanted to show you just how easy this recipe is. And this is where I want to talk to you about self-rising flour. Self-rising flour is nothing more than the flour with the leavening agents mixed in already. And the leavening agents in a quick bread um, are baking powder, baking soda, and salt. That's what makes muffins or pancakes or waffles or um, cakes, cookies. That's what makes them rise. Whereas in a yeast bread, it's the yeast that's producing gases that makes the bread rise. Um, so. Things like this, a cobbler or a cake, those are considered quick breads. And typically, they will call for either self-rising flour that has it all added in there already, or it will give you the measurements. A lot of us have recipes that were our grandmother's recipe or, or even some of the um, homemade cookbooks that will come out. It will still call for self-rising flour. Um, and so I wanted to show you how you can make that yourself. So let's start at the top. Um, the recipe called for, actually I better get my butter going first, huh? And this is actually a very old fashioned way of making a cobbler. And I'll tell you that I got this recipe from Paula Dean. She did this one day on her, her cooking show and I went, hmm. That sounds really yummy, and I think that I can do that with my ingredients. So I want to show you just how easy it was. So what I've done for you in the handout is I've actually given you the original ingredients and how she listed it out, and then my conversions, okay? So with this type of cobbler recipe, um, and I will tell you, I'm doing it in a 9 by 13 pan. That way you guys get a nice filling and crust on top and it's a little easier to serve this many people doing it like this. So if you wanted to take this to a party or a large gathering, I would definitely encourage the 9 by 13 route. Um, if I'm doing it at home for just another family coming over for dinner and we're doing dessert, um, I will do this in my round corningware dish, my tall, my deep dish corningware dish, and it fits perfect and it's absolutely beautiful um, when you get it done. So either pan would work perfectly fine okay um, but just know that when you put the batter the crust on top it does it does puff up a good bit so be wise in choosing choosing your dish because you certainly don't want it to overflow okay so what we're going to do is we're going to get our stick of butter in our pan and we're going to put it in the oven and what you're going to do now i already have my ovens preheated um, but at home you're going to then turn your oven i believe it bakes it 350, I think. Yes, preheat oven to 350. You're going to stick this in while it preheats so that you're not, there's not any dead time. You're not waiting for anything. All right. Let's see. These are my 400 ovens. So I'm going to stick this over here and let it start melting. And then we're going to get our fruit going. <clears throat> so it calls for four cups of peeled sliced peaches. I have done it. I'll be honest with you with the peel on before and I've been very happy with it. So you decide whatever you want to do. Um, one year my grandma has a, pe has a couple of peach trees and we went over and I went ahead and I had just discovered this recipe and so I went ahead and I sliced all my peaches and I went ahead and filled up my four cup my four cup measuring cup and then I would dump it into my quart size baggies zip lock them stick them in the freezer so then i had bags of already measured out four cups of frozen peaches and i've done that taken them straight out of the freezer and put them right into my pot and they worked with they worked great so we're going to do that i've got my um the original recipe called for two cups of sugar divided because you're going to use part of your sweetener here on the fruit and part of your sweetener is going to go in the the batter or the crust so we're going to pour this here and then we need a half a cup of water to start melting this down. <clears throat> there we go. And now we're going to start making our crust. 
All right, the recipe calls for a cup and a half of self-rising flour. And this is where I want to talk to you about um, increasing the amount of flour that you use when you're converting a recipe and using the soft wheat. Like I said before, if it's one of our recipes that already calls for soft white wheat, you're going to use exactly what the recipe says. If a recipe calls for cake flour or all-purpose flour, and it's a cake or a cookie, um, a pastry type product, and you want to use your soft wheat, here's the general rule of thumb. For every cup of flour called for in the original recipe, you're going to use an extra quarter of a cup of soft white flour. So for every cup of flour called for in the recipe, you're going to increase it by a quarter of a cup, thereabouts. So in this recipe, it called for a cup and a half of self-rising flour. Just to make it simple and easy, I converted that to two cups of soft white flour. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and measure this out. plus two teaspoons of baking powder, half a teaspoon of baking soda, and a half a teaspoon of salt. And that is my self-rising flour. Now you can actually find those measurements are in our red, Red Becker's recipe collection. Um, and it's found in the baking powder biscuit recipe. The dry ingredients in the baking powder biscuit recipe, um, that makes, self-rising flour and it makes I think that recipe and I think that recipe is two cups it calls for two cups of flour these measurements of baking powder baking soda and salt and so um, that would be your equivalent of two cups of, of self-rising flour okay now if you had a recipe that called for two and a quarter cups of self-rising flour or two and a half cups of self-rising flour I would go ahead and use the two and a quarter or two and a half cups of soft you know and still the same measurements of baking powder, baking soda, and salt. Maybe if I got to where it was a whole cup of flour more than this mix right here, then I would increase the baking powder, the baking soda, and the salt accordingly. But anywhere close, or if it calls for a cup and three quarters or a cup and a half of self-rising flour, this is the mixture that I use right here without, having to, without changing the baking powder, salt, and soda. All right. All right, so we've got our water and our fruit and our honey granules in our saucepan, and we're just going to bring this to a boil, and we're going to let it simmer for 10 minutes. And we've got our dry ingredients mixed up over here. Now, um, this is our other cup of honey granules. Obviously, obviously, we all know if we've watched Paula Dean that she loves her sugar and she loves her butter, okay? Um, I have actually made this cobbler recipe. Um, I made it for my Sunday school class. Um, we had a Sunday school class retreat, um, and I cooked for the, the whole group of us, and we had about 40 adults on this retreat. Um, and we did meatloaf and mashed potatoes and green beans and peach cobbler. One night was our big meal together. And so I was doing the peach cobbler in, like, industrial chafing dishes. Um, well, they were baking in the oven, and there sat my honey granules that was supposed to go in my crust. And I went, oh, no, what am I going to do? Now, it was still, it had just started baking, so it was still kind of wet. So I ended up just opening the oven, pulling the pan out, and I just reached in with my hand, and I just kind of sp sprinkled it on top. I didn't even use all of it. I only used some of it, and it turned out fantastic. So... If you want to try this recipe, leaving the honey granules out of the batter just so that you're cutting down on the amount of sweetener that you're using, absolutely. Or cut it in half. Or do like what I did, mix up the batter without it in there, and then just kind of sprinkle it over the top a little bit. Um, so I wanted you to know that was a total oops on my part, but it ended, out, it ended up working out just fine. So... I actually had my best friend growing up. Her husband absolutely loves this recipe. And years ago when my husband and I finished our basement, he was an electrician. And so he came over and helped my husband 
run all the wiring and hook it all up. And uh, I asked him before he came over, I said, you know, well, how much are we going to owe you? How much do you want us to pay you? He goes, if you'll just make me my very own peach cobbler, then that will be fine. And so I did. We, uh, I made them dinner. They came over and had dinner with us, and we had peach cobbler for dessert. And as they started to leave, I said, well, I promised you your very own peach cobbler. And so sure enough, I had made a separate one in a to-go container just for him. So he had his very own peach cobbler. So it's, it is pretty tasty. I'm going to use our cup and a half of milk. And this recipe is, it's, it's different, but then at the same time, it's very, very traditional. This is a very old fashioned, traditional way of doing cobbler. Um, in that what we're going to do is we're going to, in a minute, we're going to dump our batter into our baking dish, into the melted butter. We're not going to stir it at all. We're just going to pour it right over the melted butter. And then we're going to ladle our fruit in on top of the batter. And then as it cooks, the batter and the crust rises to the top. But it really makes it very, very moist because it's had the opportunity to sit in all of this juice and everything. And that's actually where um, double acting baking powder comes in. Um, double acting baking powder, it reacts the first time when you mix it in with the liquids. It'll start doing its thing, making it kind of bubbly. And then it reacts a second time in heat. Um, and so that's, that's why it's called double acting baking powder. I have, I have, I do it all the time with soy milk for my daughter. Uh, and actually I think I used rice milk uh, for her the last time that I did it. Um, and it works just fine, just, just fine. Yes, if you were going to use canned fruit instead of fresh, then yeah, I would. You wouldn't, you wouldn't need to put the water because it's already got the liquid there. And if you, now, I don't advise it, but if you did the canned fruit that's in the syrup, I probably wouldn't put the sweetener either. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do that. I try to stay away from canned things as much as possible because of the aluminum issue. Not to mention all the other stuff and preservatives that they put in there. If I can't get it fresh from the produce section, then I will use fresh frozen before I do canned. But that's just, that is, that is where I'm at personally. All right, while we're waiting on this, I want to get something going for later. And I, I told myself, okay, if you find yourself with a few minutes of time, take it. Because we're going to have pizza later on. And I want to get, I want to get the sausage smoking so that it's ready when we're ready for it. <clears throat> These are our Cameron stovetop smokers. This is actually our, um, and this is our Jacquard um, burner. It uses a butane tank. So this is great to have on hand in case of power outage or anything like that to have something on hand that's non-electric that you can cook on. Um, during the ice storm a couple of years ago, we were without power for about four or five hours at our house, and it came in very handy. I made macaroni and cheese for my kids and hot chocolate and all kinds of stuff. Even though we were out of power, I have a couple of these burners, and uh, we use them to go camping with. They're just, they're absolutely wonderful. Um, Sorry, my hair is driving me crazy today. It feels like it's all in my face. Um, and then our Cameron stovetop smokers, this is um, an excellent gift. Excellent, excellent gift um, for that husband or that dad or that brother-in-law. Brother-in-laws, I think, are actually harder to buy for than, than husbands and fathers. Um, because you haven't known them your entire life, and so you're really not quite sure what they want. Um, so we try to eliminate that by girls drawing girl names and then my husband has to buy for the boys and that way it's not my problem to come up with something. But this is an 
excellent, excellent gift. Um, it goes right on your stovetop. It will work on gas. It will work on electric. Um, I have a glass top stove and it works just fine. You might read your owner's manual. A lot of times your glass top stoves um, will discourage you from using something that hangs over the burner because they say that it can it can dark it can cause dark spots it can, it can blacken your stove that's totally up to you usually it's just a cosmetic thing um, so uh, but it can work you can work use it over an open flame and you can even work use it on your grill it just needs heat to go on the bottom and this is how it works let me get my smoking chips you know what that's not what I want and I am so not tall. Yes, I got it. There are two different size ones. No, this is the large one. The other one is very, it's very small. It'll only hold like really just two chicken breasts is all that it will hold the small uh, Cameron smoker. I would really recommend the bigger one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have a glass top stove and it's just fine. Um, I am using, all this is, is wood chips. There is no chemicals, nothing. And this is from an apple tree. So it is apple wood chips and that is it. No artificial anything. So you put that right in the bottom of the pan. Then you've got your drip pan that goes here that catches any of the juices and stuff. And then your rack that lays right there. Now you can certainly put liquid in this drip pan if you want. I have put apple cider here um, along with the apple wood chips, sprinkle some cranberries in there and then done chicken breasts and barbecue. Very, very good. Um, ribs, absolutely fantastic. So today we're just gonna use This is just turkey sausage links, the breakfast turkey sausage links. And this only takes like 15 minutes to smoke. It's not like the pressure cookers that speed up the cooking process, um, but it does infuse all that nice um, smoke flavor. So what you're gonna do is you're going to Light your burner here. And you're gonna center that flame right underneath where you put the wood chips, okay? Now you're just gonna slide your lid on. And what we're gonna do is you're gonna leave it kind of cracked open here and you're gonna wait to see some of the smoke starting to escape. And when you see the smoke starting to escape, you're going, that's when you're going to close the lid, you're gonna start your cooking your timer for your cooking and you're going to lower that to a medium um, a medium flame because uh, you don't want it to burn up all the wood super super fast and then the smoke be gone um, so we're just going to watch for that to to start coming out um, I have never I have never set the smoke detector off okay um, but however I have, um, you can smell it, and it will make your whole house smell um, like something's smoking in there. Now, it's not like a bad, something's burning, get out kind of thing. It's that, it's that like barbecue pit smoke smell. Um, I have done hamburger patties in there. Oh, do y'all see it? It's kind of hard to see because of this thing steaming, but do you see the smoke starting to come off? This just allows you to be able to hold on to it without it getting hot. All right, so we're just gonna close that up. It's so much harder doing everything backwards. All right, and now we're just gonna kind of scoot this off to the side and let it do its thing. Um, I will tell you with Christmas coming up, um, if you have a loved one that loves to smoke things, smoke food, um, not smoke things. Um, set that timer. 
Um, that always, it always sounds so weird. Oh, what are we smoking today? You know, um, I mean, gosh, we are storing wheat and everything, but we're not that out there. Um, but if you have somebody that loves smoked foods, loves ribs and to smoke turkeys and things like that, um, we have the, um, is it the, Ori is it Orion? Is that what it's called? Yes. The Orion, yes, I heard, a, I heard a manly yes come from behind the curtains. Um, the Orion smoker is one that you can do like whole turkeys in and racks of ribs. So if you have a big time, you know, grill master living at your house, um, that would be a huge consideration for a Christmas gift. It's $150 and it uses um, charcoal is what it uses, um, but it's a convection smoker as well. It's absolutely wonderful. I think my dad owns three of them now because with the size of our family, um, I mean, you get nine kids and all their spouses and kids and um, aunts and uncles and grandma. And of course, when we're cooking, all the friends want to come too when my parents start cooking for a large crowd. So um, I think dad's up to owning three of them now um, and we will fill those bad boys up up with stuff for thanks we do smoked turkey for thanksgiving now um instead of you know the traditional in the oven um and so which leaves the oven free to cook all kinds of stuff so um definitely check out the orion um smoker as well all right let's get our pan out and let's put our cobbler together and my timer's about to go off for the cake so, nope, I'll put this together and then I'll check it. All right, so we've got our melted butter here. All right. Yes, it does. The smoke smell will stay in your house. You know, if you did it for dinner, you would probably wake up and still smell it kind of in your house. Um, you know, it's gone by later that day. Um, and it, if you don't tell your husband that you're having something smoked for dinner and he comes home from work and you're cooking it, he will most likely smell it in the driveway. And so will all your neighbors and be like, whoa, whoa what's going on over there? Um, so, but like I said, it's not a oh no, something's burning, call the fire department. It's that, you know, did we just move in next to Williamson Brothers kind of smell. <laughs> All right, we're just gonna spoon our fruit filling. Y'all see it already like puffing up because of the hot butter and the hot pan and the hot fruit. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to make um, the whipping cream that we're gonna serve to go on top of this and then set it aside. And then that way, when the cobbler comes out of the oven, the girls are ready to go. I love the, um, all of our pots and pans that I'm using today are made by um, Fissler. It's the same company that makes our pressure cookers. Um, and I love, this is actually uh, their ladle that they carry and it's pointed at the tip. And so you can really get down into the corner and get a lot more than you would ever be able to with a regular ladle. All right. So there is our cobbler. I'm gonna go ahead and get it in the oven. Can someone tell me really quick how long it bakes for from my handout? 30 to 40 minutes, 30 to 45, okay. And a lot of that, ha that baking time has to do with um, what kind of fruit you're using. Obviously some fruits are higher moisture than others. So we're gonna, I already know that my ovens are finicky and usually take longer than normal. So I'm going to go ahead and just set it for 35. Okay, let's check our cakes.
Let's see here. My knife came out clean. So we are good. Can I get one of those hot pads brought up to the front, please? Thank you so much. So there's our two cakes. All right. And we've got about nine minutes left on the smoker. So y'all help me remember that when that timer goes off, we'll turn the smoker off and then we'll, we'll also try to dump the cakes. You know what? And I forgot to tell y'all. The, um, did y'all enjoy the oatmeal that you had this morning when you came in? Um, that recipe was taken from this cookbook, uh, The Shamrock and Peach by Judith McLaughlin. Um, and she has become a dear friend of ours. Um, she is from Ireland. Um, this cookbook is absolutely fantastic. Now, you will have to convert most of her recipes because she calls for white flour, white sugar, that sort of thing. Um, but every time I, every recipe I've done out of this cookbook has been so yummy. She just, she eats, it's real food. Um, I realized that my family eats very much like this, meat and potatoes and vegetables and things like that. Um, but Judith is coming. She's done several cooking classes with us over the last year or so. And she's actually coming back and she and I are doing a Celtic Christmas tea class um, in December the 13th. Is that what it is? December the 13th. So there is still room in that class to register um, for it. But that's where her, um, and it's actually the very first recipe in the cookbook is um, is the oatmeal that I uh, served you this morning. And this is our store copy. So every time I convert something, I actually write in there my little notes of how I converted it. So, um, but it's also, it's an absolutely, see, there's more. Um, it's an absolutely gorgeous cookbook. Her husband is the photographer who took all, who took all the pictures of Ireland. And it just, it, um, it kind of follows their journey from Northern Ireland um, to uh, the United States and moving here to the Southeastern United States in spe specifically and how the food that we eat here really is connected with um, where all those Irish immigrants, when they moved, especially to Savannah and to Atlanta and, the, and this area um, of this part of the country, how it really, it matches up. So that's why it's called the Shamrock and Peach. So it's a fantastic cookbook, also a wonderful Christmas gift um, for someone. And if you come to the class um, on December 13th, Judith will be happy to um, autograph any books that you would like for her. So I actually bought that for two of my best friends and my sister-in-law last year for Christmas, and um, they absolutely loved it. So, all right, moving on to cookies. Cookies can sometimes be a little bit tricky if you're, if you're just starting out. We are actually going to be in the Breadbecker's recipe collection for this recipe. So if you have that and would like to turn to page 50, that's where the two cookie recipes are found in the cookbook. There you go, Maggie. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, let's see what I need here. Um, hey, Maggie, will you please bring me the, the two little whips that I used earlier? We're also going to try something new here today. Mom has done this at home, um, but I have not tried it in class. Um, previously, um, to do cookies with the assistant mixer, you had, thank you so much. You had to use the stainless steel bowl and the roller and the scraper that came with it to do all your cookies with. Um, and it was kind of, I'll be honest with you, the roller and scraper, though it's excellent for making bread, um, it's kind of a pain to cream butter with. That is the one area I feel like the KitchenAid um, really outperforms 
it's actually the only area that the KitchenAid outperforms the assistant, and that's the ability to cream butter. Uh, the KitchenAid can cream cold butter like that, and it's because it uses those, that hard paddle. There's no way for that paddle, that um, batter paddle to, to, bl to bend or anything like that. And so it's really able to cream butter. Um, but mom said that she actually used this in a couple of cookie recipes the other day. She used the new um, whips that go to the double whisk bowl to do cookies. Um, before they were, the company was very, very adamant not to use the double whisks to try to do cake batters, um, or not necessarily cake batters, but cookies, um, because you could break them very easily because of all the wires. Um, and the, this double, or this single wire whip, seems to be just fine and seems to work just fine. So, looks good to me. Okay. So page 50 in the cookbook, we're going to do the, <clears throat> if you are a traditional oatmeal raisin kind of fan, then that ranger cookie recipe is going to be the recipe you're going to want to do. Um, you can leave the nuts out if you want to. You can use cranberries. You can use raisins. Whatever kind of dry fruit you like, if you like that oatmeal dry fruit cookie, then that's the recipe that you're going to want to do. Um, today, I'm going to actually do the flax oatmeal cookies, um, but I'm going to do the chocolate chip cookie variation listed at the very bottom. Um, I am not... I am not an oatmeal cookie kind of fan. Um, and so when, I don't remember who originally gave us this flax oatmeal cookie, or maybe mom just came up with it. I can't remember, to be honest with you. It was so long ago. Um, but I really just wanted a traditional chocolate chip cookie. Um, I'm like, why does it have to have oatmeal in it all the time? I just want the chocolate, really. Um, and so I made this chocolate chip cookie variation. You could leave the flax seed out and um, if you wanted to, but it does add some added fiber and some added nutrients there that are really good for you. So I am gonna go ahead and I'm going to use my little Tribest personal blender to grind up my flax seed. Here again, flax seed is too oily to go in your grain mill. So do not put flax seed in your grain mill. But a coffee grinder or the Tribest personal blender works wonderful for things like, like this. There we go. Um, that is the, that's the downside to using a coffee grinder. Now the coffee grinder that we carry is pretty wide open and you're able to completely wipe it out and kind of get around the blade. Um, that's what's nice about the Tribest Personal Blender. Here's your blade. It screws on and you invert the cup. It comes with two large cups and two shorter cups. Um, it was designed to be a personal smoothie to do your personal smoothies and things like that. Um, and it works wonderful because, like I said, here's your blade, sit that in the counter, and you can drink your smoothie right out of your cup. Um, and that's what it was designed for, but it does a great job of nuts and seeds and things like that because you're not digging around the bottom of the blade trying to get it out. Yes, Miss Lori. It is. It really is a nice, I mean, and it does a nice, really nice job of grinding, a really nice job. So it's definitely worth the investment. I, I, I believe that it is. All right, so we've got our two sticks of... If you wanted to chop coarsely, let me show you how you would do that. You can only, I would de recommend, like, if you wanted to do nuts and you wanted to chop coarsely the nuts, do only, a, like, a little bit at a time and then what you would do is you would just you could pulse it okay but the more you have in there the more times you're gonna have to pulse it to get everything through the blades but the more times you pulse it the finer it's going to get so you just got to kind of play with it you can certainly use it for spices and it's a polycarbonate plastic so it does not retain odors um, if you come to my, which I need to, I need to schedule a pasta making class. We've had a couple people ask for that. Oh, 
Um, I'm going to walk out here so I can turn this off a little easier and so that I can double check this. Um, the pasta making class, oh yes, that I do, um, I use it to make Alfredo sauce in. Um, to chop up my garlic and my um, cream cheese and my butter and my milk and I blend it all up, stick it in the microwave. Take the cake out of the pan. Yes, I'm going to. Um, thank you for that reminder. Um, but because of it being polycarbonate, you can do things like garlic and herbs and things like that, wash it out with warm soapy water and turn right around and do a strawberry and yogurt smoothie and it's not going to taste like garlic. So it's really, really nice. Okay. Hold my breath. We're going to get the cakes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. There's still a little. Let's let them cool just for a few minutes. Yeah, the pans are still. If the pans are really too hot for you to be able to touch, you might let them cool just a little bit longer. You want to kind of be able to, you would want to be able to move them without them burning you. Um, and they are, but I did see that the cake is starting to release from the side. So we're on, we're on the right track. All right, so we've got our cup of butter. Now we're going to do our um, cup of sucanat. Now the cookbook says sucanat with honey. Remember, that's the same thing as honey granules. I don't want you to get confused, though, when you walk out into the store or if you shop on our website and you see sucanat with honey and honey granules listed on our website, and you'll see it out here. The, su the particular sucanat with honey that we have is organic, okay? It comes from the one factory that makes sucanat with honey, and they, also, they offer it inorganic. And so we carry organic sucanat with honey, and we carry regular honey granules. Same product, one is just organic and one is not. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Okay, her question is about um, measurements, and it's, there's actually two parts to, your, to the answer to your question. A cup of grain grinds typically into a cup and a half of flour, okay? Any recipe in our cookbook, you are going to use, if it calls for two and a half cups of flour, typically, typically, that's how much flour you're going to need. But if you're converting a recipe and you're using soft, remember, it's going to take an extra quarter of a cup for every cup of flour called for in the recipe. It also, the weather can play a complete role in how much flour you need. It's never a bad idea to have an extra quarter to a half a cup of flour on hand um, because if it's a really high moisture day or a rainy day, um, then a lot of times, yes, it does take a little bit more flour. The trick with cookies, okay, we've, we've all made Nestle Toll House cookies, okay? We can all admit that to each other. We've all made that recipe with white flour at some point in our lives. So you know what cookie dough is supposed to look and feel like. If it is really wet, add more flour till it looks the way that you know cookie dough is supposed to look, okay? Um, converting recipes like the little spritzer, the cookie spritzer recipes, um, and the cookie cookbooks. My mom and I both are total suckers for the cookbooks at the checkout. Total suckers for them. In fact, I now have to call her and go, have you already bought this one? Because if you have, I'm not going to buy it. Um, because we end up doubling up on the same magazines and then we end up here going through recipes and we have all the same cooking magazines and cookbooks. Um, but converting those holiday cookbooks that we'll, that we'll start seeing at the checkout counter here very soon. Um, Mom one year converted, she did almost every single cookie recipe in the cookbook using sucanat, one for one in place of brown sugar, honey granules, one for one in place of white sugar, and using that extra quarter cup of soft white flour for every cup of cake flour or pastry flour or whatever flour called for in that cookbook. Every single cookie turned out perfect. 
every single one of them. Um, so it's, it is definitely doable, all right? So we're gonna get this, I'm gonna turn it down low so we can start creaming this together. Our butter and our sugar. And then we're gonna get our eggs in there as well. vanilla <clears throat> and you'll notice down at um, the bottom of the recipe I'm gonna leave out the oatmeal and so since I'm leaving out that cup of oatmeal I'm increasing my soft white flour because I need to I need to replace that dry ingredient with something and so I'm increasing um, my flour. All right, so I'm going to need a total of three and a half cups of the soft white. Now, I had pre-measured all of my soft grain yesterday, and then this morning I walked in and just ground all of it together so I would have one canister full of soft white flour for me to measure out of, just to make things a little simpler. And I'm going to go ahead, and I do like to go ahead and add my baking powder, salt, and soda. I like to go ahead and add that in with my flour so that you don't get any of those clumps of soda or clumps of salt in a cookie. That's probably one of the worst things to happen. Okay. Now, here's the deal with the flaxseed. I like to add the flaxseed if I know that we are going to eat the cookie, all of these cookies, within a day or two, okay? Um, the flaxseed is very high in your um, omega-3 fatty acids, and it's very high in your good um, oils, um, but those oils will go rancid very quickly, even baked in the cookie. Okay, so what I have found that by day four, five, six, these cookies have a rancid oil taste to them a little bit. Um, so if it's something that you're making to send in a gift basket or you're making them as Christmas gifts or something and you don't know for sure if your friend is going to eat them all fairly quickly, then you might want to decide to leave the flaxseed out. It's totally up to you. But that is just something that I have found. Yes, you can freeze the cookies, absolutely. With the flaxseed in it, absolutely. And they would be fine. All right, we're just going to add our flour in here. Hold on. What's that? Oh, yes. No, the actual cookies. You can freeze the cookies already made. You can cook, you can freeze the cookie dough as well. You can, I have done it. All right, now we're gonna add our coconut. This is our dry, shredded coconut and I'm actually going to just wait a second for, to make sure and you can I don't know if you can see you can't see it as clearly as I can but I was watching as the beaters went around there was still a lot of dry flour in the very bottom so I just waited a few minutes to make sure it was picking all of that up and it did like I said this is the first time I've made cookies in the double whisk bowl like this because these be these beaters are fairly new the single, the single, the single um, wire. All right, there's our. Those are for the Bosch. The white cookie beaters that you saw out there on the shelf, those are for the Bosch Universal Mixer. 
And now we're just gonna add our chocolate chips. They say less is more, more. Oh, I broke it. Okay, well we know that that's not possible then. Well, actually it looks like it just popped off. Yay. So it didn't like that it got that thick. I don't think mom did chocolate chip cookies. Is what she didn't do chocolate chip cookies. So, yep, it just popped off. So that's a nice feature though, that it'll just, it'll just pop loose. Yes, absolutely. Which the other ones, when you would try to do cookie dough with the other whips, um, it would, it would completely, it would completely crack every plastic gear in here. So, um, so that is a, that's a really nice design that they've made there so that it'll just, it'll just pop loose because it's just a single wire and that's probably why. Um, so what I would probably do is I would get my batter mixed, dump it into the bowl and just fold in your, your chocolate chips. That's what I would do if you were going to do something this thick in here. So, hey, I don't mind learning together with you guys if y'all are okay with it. All right, I'm gonna actually let you scoop the cookies for me, if you don't mind. I think you guys all know how to scoop cookies, right? I don't need to show you how to do that. Um, and we're gonna dump the cake. All right. Let me get a spot cleared off for us here. I used to get so like stressed out about making a mistake or burning something or overflowing something. And then I realized that, you know what, that happens at everybody's house at some point. And I would rather you know that we're real people who have crazy kitchen blunders just like you, right? So. Um, yes, you might actually want to use this other one that mom, um, mom stole one from the bakery, I think. Is it in the, she took it back. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, if you want to do, if, if that one will work, it was acting funny the other day. Um. So if you want to just use two spoons, you can. It's up to you. Whatever you want to do, Sharon. I'm fine with whatever. Um, okay, we did set the timer for that. All right, good. All right, now I'm going to dump the cake then. Um, I, was, I wanted to tell you, if you do have a dairy allergy, though, um, and this is how I make that same exact recipe for um, my daughter, I just use coconut oil in place of the butter. Um, it's totally doable. We sell coconut oil here. Um, when coconut oil gets cold, it solidifies, um, and you can use it just like butter. Um, it solidifies to the point where it's really the texture of softened butter. So it works wonderful to cream together with your, with your sugars. All right, I'm going to come grab the cake. Yes, it's one for one in place of the butter. If you want it to get cold, you sure do. And what you can do is sitting out at room temperature, well, room temperature when it's warm in your house, um, it, will, it will completely liquefy. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll leave it in my pantry and most of the time it's completely liquefied. I will measure out a cup of it in my, in my measuring cup. I'll measure up a cup and I will pour it into a glass dish and then I will stick it in my refrigerator and let it get completely hard and then I will just, with a spatula or a spoon, scoop it out of that glass dish and put it right into my mixer to cream together. So that's the easiest way if you, you know, th and that way you don't have to, when you want it liquefied, you don't have to melt it down and you're constantly converting that entire jar to hard to liquid, to hard, to liquid, you're just converting what you need when you need it. Does that make sense? Abs mm -hmm. 
Yep, you can keep, yes, you can totally keep coconut oil at room temperature. You don't have to refrigerate it, okay? I'm just gonna use my little plastic spatula just to go around the edge to make sure that we release. Like I said, you don't wanna use anything metal. This one might, this pan actually feels a little warmer. Ha <laughs> ha. There we go. Um, now, which, what you can't tell is, I mean, it's leave, I mean, yes, it has left a little fine layer in there, but it completely released it and it's totally not sticking to the pan. All right, these pans are not dishwasher safe. Um, or not recommended to go in the dishwasher. But why would you need to? With just some warm, soapy water, it comes completely clean. Um, so these are, these are great. Um, I love this size, by the way, to do cinnamon rolls in um, because I will put a little bit of melted butter in my pan um, with a little bit of the sucanat and cinnamon sprinkled in the bottom. And my husband really likes it when I add pecans as well and I'd put all that in the bottom of the pan and then I put my cinnamon rolls on top of it. Then when it's done baking, I flip it over and invert it so that all that ooey gooey pecan yumminess is now oozing all over the tops of the cinnamon rolls. That's also a great way to be able to give cinnamon rolls as a gift. Have you ever like, you've wanted to do given cinnamon rolls, but you're like, how do I cook their cinnamon rolls in my nice pans and then dig it out of the pan and put it into something else. And you don't want to use those nasty throwaway aluminum ones because you know, you want to try and get away from using that stuff. Well, this is a perfect way to do it. Um, and then that way you can invert it into onto whatever you know, a paper plate or anything that you wanted to take it to someone. So um, that is that. And yay. All right. Well, there is our cake. Um, so we talked about, I'm just going to leave this sitting right here for us. We talked about um, using coconut oil instead of butter. Um, we talked about everybody feel comfortable with converting the brown sugar and the white sugar and using the sucanat or the honey granules everybody understands that sucanat with honey and honey granules is the same it's the same product it's just made by two different companies so they have to call it something different um what else soft wheat is going to be um any recipe that calls for cake flour pastry wheat um self-rising flour um, that's where predominantly you're going to want to use the soft white wheat. Um, I actually, Sharon reminded me of this question because she asked it earlier and um, I was just talking to another customer about it yesterday. If you have a recipe that calls for all purpose flour and um, we get asked a lot, which grain should I use in place of all purpose flour? It really depends on what it is that you're making because an all purpose flour is just that. It's all purpose. It can do anything, all right? I want you to understand white flour in the store is predominantly hard wheat, okay? But because they've taken all of the bran and all of the germ and all of the fiber and they've stripped all of that stuff that weighs the flour down, they've taken all that away. That's how you can make a beautiful, gorgeous cake with all-purpose flour from the grocery store. It's not that it's pastry wheat, it's that there's nothing good left in it and that's why you can make a gorgeous cake, <laughs> all right? But it is most likely, it's a high protein, low moisture, hard wheat. That's what it is and you can use it for whatever. So if you have a recipe that calls for all-purpose flour, I always ask the, when someone asks me, what should I use? I say, well, what are you trying to make? Are you making a bread that calls for yeast? Well, then you have to use hard wheat. If it's a cake or a cookie or a brownie 
or coffee cake or you know something like that that uses baking powder, baking soda, and salt, then try using the soft white wheat. Just remember that you're going to have to use that conversion and use the extra quarter of a cup for every one cup called for. So just kind of look and see what it is that you're making, okay? All right, the next thing that we're going to talk about is um, I, I've included a recipe in your handout that the last time I did this recipe was in the summertime, and so I kind of inserted this recipe, and it's the berry sorbet. Of course, it's kind of hot in here now, so I probably could have done it today, um, but it, I was thinking, gosh, it's going to be so cold. Who wants to eat anything cold? Um, the mega blend um, is I would have shown you how to use that again, um, the big food processor blender. Um, a bag of fresh frozen mixed berries I find works the best. Um, raw agave nectar as the sweetener um, works better than raw honey in this instance because of the frozen berries. Honey will just solidify and turn to like, you know, almost like taffy on frozen things. But the raw agave nectar will dissolve completely in frozen things. So it's a wonderful sweetener for when you're wanting to sweeten something that's already cold or something that's frozen. Um, and then several handfuls of salad greens. Um, the mixed berry, the dark berries hide the salad greens. And you just blend it until it's smooth. And it is the best frozen fruit sorbet and a great way to get greens, salad greens, where normally your kids might not would have eaten it. Um, so that's just, that's another option. Um, I, th I threw that in here this past summer um, because it, was, it would be a nice dessert, a nice summer dessert. Um, it would be really good on the side with the peach, with the mixed berry cobbler, actually, to be totally honest with you. So, um, so that is something that you can do. All right, the next thing that we're going to talk about is um, tortillas. And I totally forgot, Sharon, I was supposed to tell you the whole time that I was cooking this morning, you were supposed to be making tortillas. But that's okay, you keep doing your cookie thing, all right? And let's talk about tortillas for a second. That was my bad, that was my bad. I've already got some tortilla dough ready to go. So um, tortillas, we probably, we get a lot of phone calls about tortillas um, and about the tortilla maker. Does anybody already own the flat bread maker, tortilla maker? Okay. Um, and those of you who own it already, are you having fantastic, wonderful success with it? Or are you still, are you still getting there? Okay. Um, we get a lot of phone calls about this tortilla maker um, because a lot of people call and they will say, my tortillas are exploding on the machine. They're breaking apart. They're very brittle. They are not stretchy. They don't roll up. And we're having problems. Um, probably the biggest reason, the first reason that that happens um, is the the recipe in the cookbook is on page 32 of the Breadbacker's recipe collection. Um, and the recipe says to use, I believe it says two to three cups of flour is what it says. You really want to use closer to two, okay? You want, and I, want, and I left some of the dough so that you can see. You really want soft, almost like, um, have you ever made Play-Doh with your kids? It's, it's like fresh new Play-Doh. It's that really soft, really squishy. Um, you want it soft and pliable, okay? So that when you press it, it will flatten out and not break apart, okay? So really do two cups of flour. And I use hard red, I use hard white, I use soft white. I will even use the Ezekiel mixture of grains and beans sometimes to do my tortillas. Um, and that's really good. You have a question. Absolutely, you can use spelt, kamut, any of those things, okay? And some grains, like the soft, may take a little bit more flour than if you were using the hard red or the hard white. Just know you want that, you want that fresh new Play-Doh feel is what you're looking for, okay? Also, the recipe, it does not have yeast in it, but the recipe will call for you to knead the dough for like three, four minutes, something like that. That actually is very important. Um, because it does develop what gluten is there, even if you're using soft wheat or a spelt or something like that, so that it holds its shape and holds together. You do really need to bind it together by going through that kneading process. It doesn't need to knead a long time like yeast breads do because there's no yeast here. Um, 
And so uh, that's that's how you want to do that. Then what I do is after I mix it up, and I will mix it in my either in my mixer or even in my bread machine. I will mix up tortilla dough in my bread machine. Um, after I do that, I dump it out into a bowl. And then the way I have found that I like to shape my tortillas is with an ice cream scoop um, because it makes just about a perfect ball of tortilla dough. Yes, that's the peach cobbler. Berry cobbler, yes, I guess it is. And I just put them onto a cookie sheet. You could use um, a, the small little cookie scoop if you wanted to do small tortillas. Um, and then, of course, the big um, ice cream scoop does the, the bigger balls of dough. Um, if you want a small, like I said, small tortilla, do a small, smaller ball of dough. Okay. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Mm hmm. Um, yes, I would. I would just put it on the dough cycle, is what I would do, and just let it go through the kneading process only on the bread machine. Um, you know what? Most of the time, I just let it go through the 20 minute knead cycle so that I don't have to adjust it. If I was using spelt um, or something like that, I might would decrease it to only like a 10 minute knead, is all. Okay. Um, yes, if you'll put those in there and if you'll set a timer. Um, in fact, you can have that red, this red egg timer can be for you. Um, and they're just 10 minutes. Okay. And if you want to go ahead and put all three trays in there, that'll be great. Okay, so um, I said the first mistake that a lot of people make is using too much flour. Let me check my cobbler here real quick. And the cobbler is done. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it out and let y'all see that. See how the crust completely rose to the top? There we go. And while this heats up and this cools down just a little bit, I promised y'all I would show y'all how to make whipped cream earlier, and I forgot to do that. This is our ISI whipped cream maker. Also a wonderful Christmas gift. I'm going to use a pint. That's the max you can use here of heavy whipping cream. And then, um, Sharon, do you have regular agave over there by chance? All I have is the syrups. I just need like two to three tablespoons. Yeah, that's work. That'll work. Yes, carefully measured. What's great about this, using this whipped cream maker, is you have total control over what kind of sweetener you use, how much sweetener you use. I'm actually going to give it just a little bit more. And this is the, the vanilla agave syrup, since I'm adding some vanilla flavoring anyway. All right. And then my teaspoon. Um, the sky is absolutely the limit here on flavoring your whipped cream. You could add some cocoa powder if you wanted to make chocolate whipped cream. Um, you could add, we sell a whole line of organic extracts. Um, so orange extract in the whipped cream and make orange whipping cream for pumpkin pie. 
this Thanksgiving, absolutely fantastic. Like I said, the raw agave nectar completely dissolves in cold things. So it works. It, I believe that it's the best sweetener of choice here. Um, we sell one of the products that we carry out there um, is a raw cacao and raw agave chocolate syrup. Those are the only two ingredients. It's the raw agave nectar and raw cacao powder mixed together, and it tastes like old-fashioned fudge sauce is what it tastes like. Um, add about three tablespoons of that to your heavy whipping cream. That's your sweetener and your chocolate all in one. Um, and it, it's like chocolate mousse is what it, the, the consistency is. All right. And then you purchase these are one one use cartridges. We're gonna pressurize it. Did y'all hear that? Let's see. And now we're just gonna now that it's pressurized, give it a shake. Ah! I think mom grabbed the wrong one. There was one that was a little bit finicky the other day, and I think I found it. Oh my gosh, if this explodes in my face, you guys are gonna laugh so hard. Well, you will, won't you? They'll be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> look at that crazy lady. I think you brunked me the wrong one. The finicky one, yes. Well, it was, no, it was a little late to change it. Now, isn't it? It's already pressurized in there, Mom. It's all right. She's just trying to embarrass me on camera. I'm just kidding. I really do feel like Lucy and Ethel, like the, cho the chocolate factory. Like, it's not... See what a, it, it, it is fantastic. <laughs> okay, here, we're just gonna. Yeah, there you go. All right, it tastes fantastic. Your kids will get a great kick out of that one right there. What is it, like Mount Vesuvius or what? It was Vesuvius, yeah, that it just keeps coming. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. If you will please serve them the cobbler with a dollop of whipped cream, that will be fantastic. Yes. Have fun with that. Okay, back to tortillas. Woo! <laughs> hey, nothing like a little fun and excitement at the Breadbeckers, right? So true. All right. I'm going to make some refried beans to go with our tortillas that we're going to eat in just a few minutes. Um, these are our dehydrated refried beans. We carry them. Um, buy the pail in the two pound baggie, and then of course in the six gallon bucket if you find that you really, really like them. Um, all they are is dehydrated reef, um, pinto, they are cooked pinto beans and salt that have been made into refried beans and then they have just been dehydrated. So that all that you have to add is water to rehydrate them. Now, I really like this dip mix, the Jack and the Bean dip mix that we carry. It's a whole line of dip mixes that we carry. This one in particular um, has a very um, taco seasoning taste to it. Um, I said earlier that my daughter is allergic to milk and a lot of those little seasoning packs, taco seasoning, fajita seasonings and things all have whey powder in them as a thickening agent and whey comes from milk. Um, and she can't have them. This is just dehydrated herbs and vegetables. That is all. There is no salt added to them. Um, so if you use them as like a, a rub, a dry rub on meats, which is excellent. Um, the roasted red pepper spread dip mix is especially wonderful um, as a rub on chicken. 
So just remember that if you use them as a rub on meats or a marinade or anything like that, um, you will want to add some salt to them. All right. You just rehydrate the beans, equal parts beans to water. So we're just gonna let this warm up. And while that warms up, we're going to cook our tortillas now that our tortilla maker has gotten hot. All right, so this is, we talked about the first mistake that people make is using too much flour and making their tortilla dough too stiff and too dry. The next mistake they make is reading the directions for the owner's manual from the tortilla maker. Um, the owner's manual tells you to put your ball of dough here to press, I call these the Mickey Mouse ears, to press down with the little handles, open it, turn it, press, turn it, press. I'm like, hey, geniuses, why'd you put the big handle here if you never tell people how to use it? So this is how you're going to use your tortilla maker. One firm press till you start to hear the squeak, and that is it, okay? Now it still has to cook. <clears throat> um, it still has to cook about 20 to 30 seconds on each side. Um, this is where an electric griddle is very nice to have sitting next to it so that you can press flip it up onto the electric griddle, press a second one, flip it up onto the griddle, press a third one, and you can have all three cooking at the same time. And you can go through them very, very quickly, okay? Um, but that's it. Um, in fact, Sharon, will you get the griddle plugged in and start getting warm? Because I'm going to eventually whisk this over to you guys to finish up. Um, and then let me finish letting this cook for a minute and then we'll do another one so you can see it again. Yes, ma'am. You can. You can leave the lid down to cook it on both sides if you want to. I find that it makes this back corner harder and crispier because the weight, you know, because of the hinge being right there, there's more weight on this back. Um, and so I don't typically like to leave it closed. And then I have a real bad habit of leaving it open to teaching a class because y'all are watching it do its thing. Um, and if I closed it, that would be kind of, you know, boring. Let's see here. All right, y'all ready? Watch very closely. That's it. Today I did use hard red. I used all hard red today is what I used. But like I said, a lot of times I like using hard white. I've, I will use soft white sometimes. Kamut is really good as well. Um, and then the Ezekiel mixture of grains and beans is fantastic. Yes, ma'am. Corn tortillas. Um, okay, corn tortillas are basically impossible to make with your freshly ground corn flour, 100% corn flour, and I'll tell you why. It's because the corn that they use um, to make corn tortillas, the mesa harina flour, the corn actually goes through a process where it's soaked in lye before they, they grind it into a paste and then eventually turn it into a corn tortilla, and that's why it will hold its shape. If you tried to use 100% corn flour freshly ground corn flour um, in place of the flour in the tortilla recipe, they will crack because corn doesn't have any um, gluten to hold it together. Um, so what I have found is half and half, half soft white flour and half corn flour. It'll give you that corn taste, but there's enough soft wheat or even hard white um, that it will hold it together, bind it all together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Sorghum and corn together if you wanted to. Yep. I think, well, she just wanted corn tortillas. I don't, she wasn't necessarily looking to go gluten free. But yes, sorghum and corn are also a good combination for corn tortilla if you're wanting that texture um, or that flavor of the corn tortilla. We do have sorghum here. Yes, we sure do. 
We surely do. All right, our refried beans, that's how quickly they come together. Um, and you will, you will not believe the, the taste and the freshness that they have and the difference between this and refried beans that you would get out of the can. Um, and then this is also, you are able to mix up as little or as much as you want. Have you ever opened a can of the refried beans and nobody really ate them? And so then you're stuck with like half of an aluminum, and, and then they just end up sitting in your refrigerator and nobody does anything with them. Um, and adding that Jack in the Bean Dip really makes a, a very yummy bean, uh, refried bean. Then the other thing that the girls are gonna serve, and we just, you might just wanna ask before you start serving them out, Sharon, um, if we need to do any without dairy, because I know we do have a dairy allergy in the, in the room. Um, but this is our yogurt cheese maker. Um, is what this is, and it is a strainer that we put our plain yogurt in, and you can see, can y'all see the whey underneath there? All the whey has drained off of the yogurt, which this is what Greek style yogurt is, ladies. It's just the whey, part of the whey has been drained off, making it tartar. Um, but because it's a Greek style, and those Mediterraneans are all hot and everything, um, and we want to look just like them, we think that Greek yogurt is healthier than regular yogurt when really it's just that some of the whey has been drained off so it's more tart, that's it. Um, so you can make, and, and it makes it a little thicker. Um, but we're going to use this in place of sour cream today. And that way we get our good live probiotics that we would normally not get in sour cream because it's pasteurized and we're just using the yogurt. So we've got that, I've got that for the ladies to have. And I think here comes the, the mixed berry cobbler. Um, how long have they been in so far? For 12. Yes, just a little bit longer. <clears throat> okay. Yes, that's your question. It's a, it's called that particular little box is called our it's called a yogurt cheese maker, and what you do is you drain the the whey off of the yogurt. If you let it drain overnight, the consistency of the yogurt is now sour cream. If you let it go for a full 24 hours or longer, it's now the consistency of cream cheese. So it's how you can make yogurt into a cream cheese consistency, and then you can use that cream cheese in dips or add a little bit of strawberry jam to it and make your own strawberry cream cheese to spread on bread or toast. Um, in fact, I have, um, uh, years ago, I did a class. Um, it was a mother-daughter cooking class that my daughter Catherine and I did together. And it was for kids. It was a kid's cooking class. And it was really teaching them about making wise decisions with the food that they eat. Um, and we made like a complete meal, breakfast and lunch foods. And we were, the game was to see how many food groups could we incorporate in just those two meals. And um, I make the sorbet with the, with the greens. You know, so they got a dessert with fruits and salad greens. I also made smoothies with dehydrated, um, dehydrated uh, spinach powder. You dehydrate spinach till it's crispy and then powder it and you can add a tablespoon of spinach powder to your fruit and yogurt smoothie and that tablespoon of spinach powder is the equivalent of one cup of fresh spinach. So that's a way that they could get an entire cup of spinach at breakfast, which is not normally where they're going to think to eat a leafy green or a vegetable. Um, and so, but in that class, I actually did macaroni and cheese where I just take my cooked noodles and normally I would just pour my cooked noodles, I would drain the water off and they're all hot and everything and I pour them over my cream cheese and a little bit of butter and my shredded cheese that are in a bowl. I pour the hot noodles over it and it starts to melt the butter and the cream cheese and the cheese and then I mix it all up. Well, in that class I actually use the drained yogurt. So they're getting a live active culture cream macaroni and cheese. Um, and they all absolutely love it because you're adding, there is a little bit of butter there and a little bit of shredded cheese and it covers up the tartness of the drained yogurt. Um, so it's just, it's a really, it's $16 for the yogurt cheese maker. It's an excellent 
excellent to have on hand. If you're wanting to make sour cream, what I would recommend doing is draining that yogurt and the whey off to make your sour cream. Take it out of the strainer and put it in a Tupperware container and write sour cream on it and stick it in your fridge. Yes. No, you use yogurt. You use already made yogurt and drain and just put it in the strainer. What kind of yogurt? Whatever you want to use, whatever brand you like to use. You can even use your homemade yogurt if you want to. It's totally up to you. I, I like Stonyfield is the brand that I like to use. Um, and for parties and things like that, I don't typically buy the already flavored Stonyfield yogurts, um, but their strawberry and their French vanilla is wonderful put through the strainer um, and then used as fruit dip with a, with a platter of fruit. You had a question? Same thing, and what was your question? Yes, when you drain it, you refrigerate it, it comes with a lid, and, the, and it will hold an entire 32 ounce container of yogurt. It sure will. Um, yes, Sharon's gonna show us the, the chocolate chip cookies. So if you'll just let them cool for a few minutes and then we should have enough for everybody to have one, right? All right, and then I'm gonna let this last tortilla cook and then I'm gonna whisk them away and let you guys cook the rest and go ahead and serve the tortillas with the refried beans and the sour cream. I will show you the way the, tor the whipped cream maker is supposed to work. That was going in the trash. I don't know what the defect with that one is. But there we go. And so, and it's so hard to tell which one was the bad one once we get them all washed. And you don't know it's the bad one until it's spewing whipped cream all over the place. Thank you. Yes. Is it possible to use the whey? Absolutely it is. Whey, um, actually, it makes really soft bread if you use the whey as your liquid in your bread recipe. Now, obviously, those of us with milk allergy issues can't use the whey in our bread recipe, but it's, it's wonderful to use as the liquid in your, in your bread recipe. Makes very, very soft bread. Use it also, you know, that's what all those, you know, manly men, they're using whey powder in all of their protein shakes. So you can use that as part of the liquid in, um, you know, in a smoothie or something. And you're getting a lot of protein there. All right, I'm totally taking a bite of this. Mm, yum, yum. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, mom, will you come get this for me? If we don't start on pizza, it's never going to be ready. Soft like what? Um, yes. I mean, it just it it will help make very soft bread. Um, and it's probably because of the of the protein that's there will help. Um help in the bread process. Um, I mean, gluten's totally optional. You could leave it out completely if you wanted to, um, but, but it does help to make soft bread. Like I said, I don't ever use it at my house because of my daughter's milk allergy, so. All right, and then mom, are you, can you come, are you to a point where you can come get all this stuff, please? Did I use, I used the rice bran extract in the tortilla recipe, yes. Very good, thank you, Julie. The recipe um, in the cookbook calls for two tablespoons of that and the tortilla maker and, and all the tortillas need to keep going. Um, the recipe in the cookbook calls for two tablespoons of soy lecithin. We are actually no longer carrying the soy lecithin. Uh, the manufacturer could no longer guarantee to us that the soybeans used were not genetically modified soybeans. So we're no longer carrying the soy lecithin. We now carry a product called rice bran extract. Um, it is made from rice bran does the same thing in your bread that the soy lecithin did, making it very soft and pliable. Um, it is much more potent than the soy lecithin was, so, that, so you actually use half as much. I will tell you though, rice bran extract is specifically for baking only. 
the soy lecithin you could add to smoothies and things like that to get some of those B vitamins and the protein and everything out of it. Um, in fact, there's like an energy drink that calls for orange juice and banana and the soy lecithin in the back of the cookbook. You cannot use the rice bran extract like that. It has a very strong flavor um, and that's why you use half as much of it. So I did use the rice bran extract in the tortillas. I do think that it makes a very softer, it makes a very soft pliable tortilla and it will help if you're having a problem with them cracking. Okay, all right. Let's move on to pizza. How does that sound? All right. Any other questions about the tortillas before we move on? Because I don't want to leave anything out. Um, hey, Maggie, do you know where the great big cutting board is? Or mom, is it over there somewhere standing up? Yeah, it's in the kitchen. Will you get the big cutting boards? Thank you, if you'll bring me one of those, that'll be awesome. One thing that I did totally insert into this class that, um, that is brand new and we've never done and that's the whole reason why it's being filmed today because we actually already had this class on our website and we weren't going to film it. And I was like, well, I'm kind of doing something new today. So um, maybe we could just edit out the whole whipped cream debacle. That would be awesome. Awesome, awesome. True, true. Mom was doing a television program and she was making smoothies in the Bosch blender and the blender to the Bosch is um, the, the base of it you can unhook from the actual blender part that has the blade and everything and it was not completely like locked into place and she filled the whole thing with a smoothie and she went to pick it up off after she had blended the whole thing, she picked it up off the machine and the whole, the bottom stayed in the Bosch. And it just went whoosh, yeah. everywhere went um, smoothie, so. We were taping the show, so I thought they would just stop and we would retape it. Oh no. They just kept going. They just kept going and they aired it. Oh yeah, still to this day. So. People go, yeah, I saw you on TV when you saw it. Love the blender. Yes. Um, this is um, one recipe that I added um, to this handout. It's actually from our 2010 um, Christmas class, holiday class, um, that we did back in 2010. This is a pizza crust recipe that mom came across, and she really likes actually using it for um, tortillas. Excuse me. Uh, for tortillas and wraps, it's very, very stretchy because it does have um, yeast in it. But this is a recipe that you're going to use if you want a thin crust pizza. Um, we get asked that all the time. Um, how do I make a thin crust pizza? Um, and this is the recipe you're going to want to use. This is, um, so this is new in your handout. It's actually, I think, recipe number 10. Number nine is the pizza dough Breadbecker's recipe collection. That's just your basic dough recipe. And we're gonna actually use it in just a few minutes. Um, and then I think, am I right, is it number 11? Is the pizza crust slash tortilla flatbread, is it 10? Okay. Um, and so this, I actually made it yesterday. You actually, you make it ahead of time and put it in your refrigerator and then take it out when you're ready, the day you're ready to use it and let it come to room temperature. So um, it is, it's an excellent uh, dough recipe to freeze and take it out. Like I would, and what I would do if, if you know, say I wanna have pizza tomorrow night for dinner, take your ball of dough out of the freezer tonight and let it thaw, and then that way it has plenty of time to come to room temperature before you start rolling it out. The number 10, number 10. Um, actually, from everything we've read, once the yeast starts its whole process of making the carbon dioxide, the oxidation process is over. Yes, here is the downfall to that though, and I'll tell you right now, is that the yeast, once it's activated, will only stay alive for so long, and it's about a week. Okay. Is it? That's it. Okay. 
Yes. <coughs> yes, that is that is correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, one week in the freezer is about all that the yeast will stay alive. Now, and now, Papa John's and Pizza Hut and all them, they have those white rolly dockers that put holes in it so that you don't get a bubble. Okay, we have fingernails. See, you work with what your mama gave you, right? I don't think that's really how that saying goes, but that's more appropriate. Okay. That's all right. Yes, I hear what's really supposed to be, and I'm not going to repeat that. Um, that you use your favorite pizza sauce, marinara sauce, whatever. This is actually um, one of Denise Rogers. She's another one of our employees, and she helps teach the gluten-free classes. This is one of her family's favorite marinara sauces that stores and freezes wonderfully. And they used it in a class just the other day. And I went, well, why should I buy pizza sauce if we've got marinara right there? So that is what I'm going to use there. <clears throat> the marinara recipe is in the What the Bible Says About Healthy Living Cookbook is where that recipe is. Okay. I'm going to do see what do I want to do first we will do this one first I'm just gonna do I'm just gonna break up some fresh sliced baby portobello mushrooms it's funny I never cared for mushrooms growing up um, but I think it was that I don't like white button mushrooms is what it is I like I like the fancy mushrooms <laughs> I like the baby portabellas. I like the shiitakes. I like some of those. They de they definitely have a kind of a meatier, earthier flavor to them. And um, and it's funny, my kids, um, my kids love mushrooms. And, but it's I, those are the only these are the only ones that I buy. I won't buy just the the plain white button mushrooms. Cookies are coming around. How did y'all like the cobbler? Was that good? Good. I'm so glad. All right, what I need now is my sausage. <clears throat> and mom, will you come get the um, refried beans at some point? All right, I'm going to get some of my sausages here. I'm going to slice them up. And then the cheese that we're actually going to use today is um, some of our raw milk cheese or a yogurt culture cheese, I think, is actually the one we're using. Um, which one did you go with, Mom? The sun dried tomato? Sun-dried tomato and basil cheese is the one that we're going to use. If you wanted something that's more like mozzarella, and I know that um, what we've got in stock is kind of limited right now. It's kind of time for us to order cheese again. Um, but the one that I find is more, the most like mozzarella is the just the yogurt-cultured um, cheddar cheese. Because of the yogurt cultures, it's very, very soft and very creamy, very much like mozzarella. So, but then if you are, want a little bit of excitement, the sun-dried tomato and basil or the sun-dried tomato and garlic um, are both excellent, excellent cheeses. All right, so we're just going to sprinkle the sausage around. Okay. 
N number nine is just our basic bread dough recipe. And we're gonna roll it out in just a few minutes. But it's gonna give you more like pan pizza. That thick, soft, chewy crust. Um, pan pizza, whereas this is going to be much, your thinner, crispier crust, okay? All right, and I'm just going to spread the cheese on. I'm going to leave a little section of uh, both pizzas with a little bit of no cheese. Is that cool with you? I'm going to leave a couple sections without any cheese. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and pop this one in. You could use a baking stone if you wanted to, certainly. Okay. All right, this one, this pizza that we're going to do is um, a veggie-roni pizza. And you're going, what in the world? <clears throat> Years ago, I have a friend that lives up in Virginia named Angie. And she called me, and she and I both, we, she knew that I love watching the Food Network, Network just as much as she does. Because um, I get all kinds of ideas off of there. Um, I find, I get recipes off the Food Network's website all the time and just convert them using my ingredients. Um, so don't be afraid to try stuff like that. Um, but I love getting ideas off of their cooking shows. And um, uh, she and I both love watching Rachel Ray. And um, I've been told that that's my celebrity lookalike. Um, and she said that Rachel Ray had a recipe on there for making pepperoni out of zucchini. And I went, I don't know about that. I don't know that you can make a vegetable taste like a meat. That's just, that's a little out there. And she said, no, no, I made it and it's really, really good. And um, so I tried it and I kind of worked on it and perfected it a little bit. Um, and so the recipe that I've given you is how to make your own zucchini pepperoni. I do use the roasted red. Remember we talked about that one earlier. Roasted red, the pepper spread, is the dip mix that I like to use to make my marinade for my zucchini. And I have, I've perfected it over the last couple of years and found how I like it best. I will thinly slice my zucchini um, and then I add, I stick it in a bowl, a big glass bowl. I will put my, my thinly sliced zucchini. I'll coat it pretty liberally with salt to draw out the natural moisture that's in the zucchini. And then I will powder that roasted red, the pepper spread. I will powder that because I don't want all the chunky vegetables and everything, okay? So I'll powder it in my Tribest blender. And then what I will do is I will um, pour it, the, the seasoning mix, I will pour it over my, um, I'll pour it over my zucchini. And all of the moisture that starts coming out from the, um, from the salt that I put on there, um, it makes this nice juicy liquid and it, make, it creates its own marinade without you having to add any type of oil or water to it at all, okay? If you let it sit overnight in your refrigerator and really marinate all together, um, work, it works best. Now then you could certainly take it right out of your fridge whenever you want and put it on your pizza, okay? What I have found that I really like best is to dehydrate them after they've marinated. And then they're nice and crispy, just like a pepperoni. And they stay nice and crispy that way on your pizza. So now we're just gonna put this on. My kids absolutely love these. Now my kids like spicy and hot things, and they do, these have a bite to them. They definitely have a kick to them. Um, but I like to do this with the zucchini as well as um, yellow squash. 
because really zucchini and squash don't have a flavor of their own at all. They will totally take on whatever you, whatever seasoning you put on them. Um, I will just store them in a plastic zippy bag and then um, down in an empty six gallon bucket with a gamma lid on it is where I keep all my dehydrated foods. I have one that's all for vegetables and one that's um, for all fruit. I do keep my dehydrated foods separately. But there, I'm going to stick this one in now. And that is that. All right, now I went ahead and before class made the basic dough recipe out of our cookbook out of all hard white. Um, I have found that for pizza and French bread and things like that, I have found that it really works best with all using all hard white. You could certainly use red wheat if you wanted to. It's just probably not going to be the flavor that you're going for because um, the hard white really is very bland. It, it doesn't really have um, a real distinct flavor of its own. Um, but that lends very well when you're wanting to taste the garlic and the sauce and the meat and the cheese and, and all of that kind of stuff. So this is a double recipe. I've given you a chart in there um, of how many pizzas you should be able to get out of a single or a double or a triple of that basic dough recipe um, and the different size pans that you can use. Um, here again, I really, really like the USA pans, and they have a 12-inch pizza pan. Um, and this is this is pretty much all I use now. In fact, when we go on um, to the beach for vacation, we eat out maybe two or three nights while we're gone for a week. The rest of the time, um, we eat in, we cook in our condo, um, and pizza is one of our meals that we eat. Um, and so I will actually make my pizza crust ahead of time in the Bread Becker's recipe collection um, where the pizza where the pizza crust and French bread and all those um, the filled breads are like the the sausage bread and the Reuben bread and all those garlic rolls all those recipes are found um, there is direct there are directions on how to um, half bake your pizza crust and do plain pizza crust ahead of time. And that's what I do for when we go um, to the beach on vacation. I will roll out my pizza crust just like this, and I will dock it with my fingernails so it doesn't puff up too much. And then you bake it for only about, I think it's 12 to 15 minutes, something like that, in your oven. Um, and, uh, and then you can stack them on top of each other once they completely cool and slide them down in a unscented trash bag. Since they don't make Ziplocs big enough for something like this, um, a trash bag works great. Um, and uh, then you can take them down. What I do is I, I stack them on top of each other once they're finished baking. And, um, and then I will put my put them, slide them in the garbage bag, put them in the freezer, and let them completely freeze, um, stacked on top of each other. And then when we go to leave for the beach, I'll take them right out of the freezer, stick them in the top of our cooler. By the time we get down there, they've thawed out. I just keep them in the refrigerator, and I take my pizza pans with me. And then I pull out a pizza crust, set it on the pan, put whatever topping I want, and we bake it. And it takes like 10 minutes um, to bake the pizza all the way through. So that's another option for already having them ahead of time and in the freezer waiting for you. All right, so now we're gonna make each one of the pizzas again. Like I said, my family prefers a pan pizza style pizza. So this is what I use. And for the last couple of years that I've taught this class, this was the only type of pizza that I served. Um, was using the basic dough and everybody was always like well what about for a thin crust and what do we do there and I would just tell them we'll go have them print the recipe for you from the from the holiday um, class in 2010 so this time I decided well I think I've got enough time that I can I can squeeze it in there myself and make it for you so um, today you guys get extra pizza not a bad deal I guess 
and we're gonna I'm gonna put this one together and then I'm gonna take a minute um, actually is it really only 1220 oh we're doing better than I thought we were doing then I'll just keep doing what I was gonna do uh-huh Um, her question is regarding the instructions for the um, the crispier crust pizza dough. You do you mix the water and the flour together, and you let it just sit in the bowl. And then I just dumped all the other ingredients on top, is what I did, and then let it knead for about five minutes. It was a little, and I did end up having to add because yesterday was so dry. There was like no moisture in the air here yesterday whatsoever when I made it. Um, so it was very dry outside. I did have to add a little bit extra water um, to get it to soften back down just a little bit. It was a little too stiff um, when I made it yesterday. All right, what have y'all been eating? Did y'all eat the cookie? Get the cookies? Oh, and now you're doing the tortillas? Have, has everyone had the tortillas or are they working on it? Did you enjoy the tortilla? And um, like the directions for the crispy crust, mom loves using that dough for tortilla dough. Um, it makes wonderful, very, very soft, flexible wraps. Um, so, like for chicken salad and things, wraps like that, where you're filling it up with something, um, those, are, those are really, really good to use. You're not on a microphone. Did you know that? <clears throat> so all of you get got all that wonderful wealth of no and knowledge, but nobody else online got it. So what mom was saying, no, that's all right. What mom was saying was that this recipe um, is really, really good because traditional pizza dough should sit in the refrigerator for several days before you make it. Um, and so that's what's so nice about this recipe is that you can make it ahead and have all your, you could certainly even divide them up if you have the 12-inch pizza pan. You could divide it by how much dough you need for your pizza pan and section it off into your baggies and keep it in there and then pull one out when you're ready to use it or whatever. So it's very, very flexible dough. Will the tortillas get brittle? Um, they will if you overcook them or if you cook them until they are done on the tortilla maker. Um, then once you put them in the refrigerator, they will tend to get a little bit brittle. I mean, you can just pop them in the microwave or in the oven to warm them back up and they'll soften up a little bit. But what I have found that I really like to do is for the tortillas that we're gonna have for dinner that night, I will fully cook them the way I like them. For the ones that I know are gonna go in the refrigerator for for later use, I will undercook them just slightly so that when I warm them up, they kind of finish cooking and they're not so brittle. Does that make sense? Big is the trick. Well, these are wonderful, by the way, if you haven't noticed how wonderful um, these are. Um, also, if you will put your dough, and I totally meant to show you this, but if you'll put your dough in the middle of your pan and press around the edge, kind of leaving a bubble right in the middle, and as you're rolling to the edge of your pan, you're pulling a little bit of dough from this big hump in the middle and pushing down. That will keep you from getting a completely bare center, center, so that then when you cut it and you pick up the piece and all of the topping falls off the tip of the pizza crust because the tip is so thin in the very middle, that's what will happen if you 
if you go ahead and like try to push this all out and then you start pulling from the middle, this is going to get very, very thin and it's not going to, um, it's not going to hold together very well. So that's just a little trick of pizza shaping that I have learned over the years. We have a couple different size pizza pans in the store. Um, the USA line only makes this 12 inch. And like I said, I actually really like this. Um, with my daughter's milk allergy, she obviously has to have, um, you know, pizza with no, uh, with no cheese on it or anything. And, um, and so um, I have to do her special. And uh, so now it's kind of started where, you know, my husband and I like, you know, peppers and onions and olives and all that kind of stuff. And so what we'll do is, um, there's a bay leaf in there. Um, you know, my boys, they'll share a 12 inch pizza. Catherine will get her own 12 inch pizza and then he and I get our own with all of our toppings um, on them. And so it makes it, makes it really nice. Everybody gets what they want on their pizza. All right. Yes, these are our um, our tortilla keepers that the um, that the tortillas fit down in, and they stay warm. And then you can, because these are oven safe, right? Because you can warm your your tortillas back up, stacked in here in the oven, which is really really nice, especially if you're trying to get away from using your microwave so much. Um, that's it's really nice to have those. Okay. And I totally just realized that I put, I made that other sausage and mushroom and put cheese on the whole thing. So I'm going to leave a cor corner of this one empty and put sausage and mushroom on it for you. Okay. Sorry. Usually I'm like really good about leaving cheese off of things. You wouldn't think that I have a child that I could kill if I gave her milk. All right, and as soon as we finish this pizza and get it in the oven, then we're going to go back and ice our cake. And of course, it'll be ready while our cake, while our pizza's bake. So we'll have cake first and then pizza. So got to love doing it backwards. Yes, ma'am, do you have a question? To make my pizza dough? Um, I made all of it uh, today with my assistant mixer my kitchen mixer that I mix all of my bread dough up in. Um, if you own the bread machine, you can certainly use that to do the kneading for you. Whatever you use to do your knead, to, to knead your bread dough, it's gonna be the same thing. In fact, because this recipe right here, the basic dough recipe from our cookbook, that's all it, I mean, that's all this pizza crust is, is the same dough that I would turn around and use to make sandwiches with, so. Um, in my bread machine, I do. Yeah. The bread machine, the tip, typically the bread machine needs uh, for 20 minutes um, is how long you're going to let your bread knead in there. Um, in the kitchen mixer, the assistant, it's going to go um, about six to eight, depending on how much dough you're doing in there. I want to show you something, too, really quick. Well. In the Bosch machine, it's going to be six to eight minutes, something like that. However, you normally, whatever bread recipe, and that's the thing. If you have a yeast bread recipe that you really like, and that's what you use for your bread, and you like a pan pizza style pizza crust, just use that recipe. Whatever bread recipe you like, use that one for your pizza crust. Just use all hard white wheat to get the flavor that you want. That makes sense. I have flour in my nose, and it's gonna make me sneeze in a minute. Okay, let me get this one in the oven. <clears throat> okay, now <clears throat> I think I have enough, Sharon. If you will take these, and anybody who would like to try a zucchini pepperoni plain like this. Um, Y'all feel free to do that if you want to put them in the little plastic cups for them. That will be great. I want to show you something. This is totally, we're going off the reservation here. 
I want to show you something that I have really that I've been doing for my family, and they absolutely love it. And since we're co coming up on the holiday season, this is actually I make gift baskets for a few of my really close friends every year, and every year it has a different theme. Um, and this year, this is what they're getting. Um, I take that basic. I'm going to take. I take my basic dough recipe, um, which makes two pounds worth of dough, and I'm splitting it. Um, actually, how I'm going to do it in my, I'll show you exactly how I'm going to do it in my baskets. I'm going to divide this into four. So these are half pounds. Uh, this is about a half a pound worth of dough. They're spicy, aren't they? Yeah, they're really good. Um, I'm going to make them into an oblong loaf like this just a free form. You could certainly make them completely round if you wanted to. Hey, Mom, can you come check the pizza for me? Is she in the building? Hey, Mom, is that you? Can you come check the pizza for me? This is how you make free form loaves. I'll make one more oblong one. My kids are totally loving bread this way, which they are so funny about the bread that I make. It is the same recipe every time, but they get really, really funny about the different shapes that I make it in. And I'm like, it's all the same dough, you guys. It tastes exactly the same. But some days they really like sandwiches on hoagie rolls. Other days they like um, sandwiches on hamburger buns. Some days they like it like this, free form. So then what you do, um, timer two is the bottom, yes. And then just with a very sharp serrated knife, you're going to cut it before it starts rising, okay? So now these are going to rise free form till they're double in size and they're going to bake just like this. You could certainly do an egg white wash, sprinkle it with poppy seeds and sesame seeds or whatever you want um, on top here. Um, but in each one of my little gift baskets is going to be a loaf like this and then this is kind of the fun part. <clears throat> Has anybody ever made their own butter? So, so easy. We were talking earlier about the benefits to use um, to your good live active cultures that we get from yogurt. Okay, I totally get it that not everybody is a yogurt fan. Not everybody likes yogurt, okay? Not everybody um, likes smoothies and kefir. And that's just, some people, that's just not their thing. I don't know that I've met anybody who doesn't like butter though, okay? Um, so what is a way that we can make our butter just a little bit healthier? And this was actually first introduced, this, this uh, idea was first introduced here at Breadbeckers in a class that my brother Caleb did all on fermentation. And you can actually watch that class on our website. <clears throat> um, and he actually made uh, cultured vegetables, sauerkraut, um, yogurt, kefir, and then he also made um, kefir, uh, not kefir, cultured butter. Let me see. Um, what happened to the heavy whipping cream? You used it. That's all right. You used it to make uh, the whipped cream in the good machine. Oh, well, okay. What you're going to do, we're all going to use our imagination here, okay? Um, you're going to pour a pint of heavy whipping cream. And in this instance, I am very particular and I use organic heavy whipping cream, okay? A pint of heavy whipping cream. Glug, 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 glug. Okay, we're going to pour it in there, okay? Um, we sell a product here. Um, it is a vegetable culture starter. It's what you would use to start sauerkraut or to make cultured vegetables, just like a yogurt starter or a kefir starter. It's got the live probiotics and all the, the good bacteria. Oh, thank you. Here is the veggie culture starter. Um, we sell it in a six pack and we also sell it in a single pack, okay? So you're gonna pour your pint of heavy whipping cream, glug, 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 glug. 
you're going to rip open one packet of your veggie culture and you're going to sprinkle it in there. You're going to stir it with a whisk. Then you're going to put the lid on it. And you're going to shake, 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 shake. And then you're going to leave it sitting on your counter for 24 hours. Okay? What you have then made, and now the magic of television, what you have now made is sour cream. Okay? Live probiotic sour cream. Okay? That's exactly what it is. Soured cream. That's what it is. Okay? Now, so 24 hours, you have this thickened, the bacteria has grown on the heavy whipping cream. You've made your own sour cream. You're going to put it in your refrigerator so that it gets cold. Okay? <clears throat> then what you're going to do is you're going to make butter with it. Now, there are many ways that you can do this with, um, um, I mean, you can do it in the jar where you just put the lid on it and you start shaking. And you shake and you shake and you shake and you shake until the butter separates from the buttermilk. Um, and then you can, and then you press the butter and press all the buttermilk out of it and you have your butter. You can use um, a whisks, um, you know, like a hand beater. We're going to use the double whisk bowl today because it goes super, super fast. Um, and I need, yes. Um, just until it gets cold. Oh, I've got the post, Mom. I didn't realize it's sitting right here. Just in, it'll whip faster if it's cold. That's the reason why you let it get cold. Yes, at room temperature, it can take as up to 30 minutes. And so that's why letting it get nice and cold really is a benefit. All right, so now what we're going to do, we're just going to pour this. Into our double whisk bowl. <clears throat> now, um, one thing that we have found, one thing you'll notice. And it's going to be a little harder for you to see it, um, but it's going to whip the whipping cream into whipped cream, um, and it'll get it'll um, get that texture, that heavy, that thick, that stiff whipped cream texture. You let it just keep whipping, and you would do this if you wanted to make sweet cream butter. Sweet cream butter is just heavy whipping cream whipped into butter without the soured cultures. That's what sweet cream butter is, okay? So you could, if you just wanted to make butter for yourself, heavy whipping cream and the double whisk bowl to the assistant will make butter really, really nice. What you're gonna do is you're gonna, see now it's at probably like a soft peak and you're gonna let it keep whipping past a stiff peak point. And then what you're gonna notice is that all of a sudden it'll turn a yellow color has something to do with the bacteria and the air and the whipping. It'll turn a yellow color and then it will look very crumbly. It'll have a crumbly look. Did y'all ever see that episode on Sesame Street where they made cheese and, um, and they were skimming the curds off the way to make the cheese? And that's, it'll have that crumbly curd look to it. And then all of a sudden, and this is when, when it starts doing that, That's when you will need, this is the cover that comes with the assistant. That's how it stays. It also acts as a bowl for most of the attachments that fit onto this machine. And then it also acts as a splash guard 
when the butter starts to separate out, it'll get that curd, that curdle look, and that crumbly look, and then that's when you'll want to cover it because all of a sudden that butter milk starts to separate off and it will start sloshing out at you, okay? So we're just gonna watch this. I did notice a big difference the other day. I made butter um, in the prep kitchen and we have an assistant mixer that's in the prep kitchen and it's one of our older ones back before they upped the wattage on this. So high on this one is a lot higher than the high on the older model assistance. Um, and so it did take about four to five minutes longer on the older assistant than it did on the newer one. So I did notice a big difference with that. Hmm? What? Yeah, you can just set it right there if you want to. It's warm enough in here. Sorry, I can't hear you. I see your mouth moving. Yes, yeah, because it has whipping, the whipping, uh, the whipping disc, the whipping blades that it has with it. Yes, absolutely you can. Um, the Bosch mixer uh, comes with batter whips and um, I think it comes with whipping whips is what it comes standard with. And then you purchase extra batter whips for cakes and then the cookie paddles for cookies. But what it comes standard with is to be able to do whipping cream, okay? And you can do it in a blender too. I am just gonna scrape the side down just a little bit from the, the cream that's starting to build up. And we're just gonna keep going. But my plan this Christmas is to put, um, I'm probably gonna do some fresh muffins some blueberry muffins or something like that, a, a small loaf of the bread, and then I'm going to make my own cultured butter and pack it in little half pint jars and screw a lid on, and that's what's gonna go in my basket this year. So obviously you would not want to cook with this butter because cooking with it would kill all of those live active cultures that you just worked so hard to put in there. Well, as hard as working is to leave a jar sitting on your counter. But to go to that trouble and, and the steps and everything, you know, you wouldn't want to bake with it. It would strictly be table butter to spread on things. <clears throat> Are the pizzas coming out? My, uh, one of the employees, Rebecca, she and I were making butter yesterday and she sta we're both just standing here and watching and it's kind of like that watched pot never boils kind of thing. You know, the watched cream never turns to butter. But it really isn't that long of a process if you think about it. Yes. Would this cultured butter be good on the butter dish that we sell? Yes, absolutely, and inside the butter bells that we carry, yes. All right, can you, can you kind of tell that it's starting to get a little grainy looking in there? <clears throat> I'm gonna stop it just for a second so that you can see. Do you see how it kind of looks grainy all of a sudden? It's about to start separating off. You can also start to kind of feel, is it gonna splash out at any moment? There it goes. <laughs> it was starting to splash. the butter. I'm actually going to let it go just for a second longer. Okay. Um, I mean, if, 
if you don't want it to, it'll spoil faster leaving it out. Um, but it, I mean, if you put it in the fridge, it'll get hard, you know, but I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna be so good. You're gonna eat it really fast, especially if you put it out like with a meal or something like that. Um, it'll go very quickly. Yes, we're gonna let you um, pass it around so you can kind of see, and then um, and then I'll show you what I do to it after after that. And then I'll sh I'll show you when she gets back up here with it how I how I how I proceed from there. Um, Maggie. Is she in the kitchen? I just need one of one of the bowls that I've been using, one of the red, green, or blue bowls. One of those, please. Um, what I've also started doing, <clears throat> and this is part of an experiment that we've been doing. You have, I, did y'all see my little yellow sticky notes? Third generation buttermilk, third generation cream. Um, there is nothing in the directions with the vegetable culture on how to reculture another batch of cream. It can be done with yogurt. It can be done with kefir. Um, so I figured, why couldn't I reculture another batch of cream without having to purchase another vegetable culture starter? So I've been doing some experimenting with it. And kefir, to reculture kefir, you take two tablespoons of your already made kefir, and you add it to another pint of milk to make another pint of kefir. I figured that this is probably, the, the live bacteria is probably a little bit diluted. I'm thinking it might be a little weakened since you've separated the butter, the fat, off of the buttermilk. Um, and so I, and this is just an assumption on my part, I figured since it's a little bit weaker, I would just double the amount of buttermilk I use to reculture my next batch. So I use four tablespoons of the buttermilk, which is... Um, a quarter of a cup, a quarter of a cup of the buttermilk to reculture another pint of heavy whipping cream. And this right here, this that I made is third generation cream. It's the third generation off of it. And I, the, and how you would know if it wasn't working anymore is it wouldn't thicken because the bacteria wouldn't grow on the cream if the bacteria is dead. Now, kefir, you can reculture up to seven generations uh, before you have to start with a new, a new batch. The cool thing about this is that one batch of cream that I just made, it makes about a cup of butter. It also makes a cup of buttermilk. So even on the first generation of buttermilk, I can reculture four more batches of cream to make four more cups of butter. So it goes a very, very long way. And then what we're gonna do, so this, so this is the heavy whipping cream that I cultured with vegetable culture starter and then whipped into butter. So live active cultures, good probiotics, No, it's not yogurt, it's not kefir. This is heavy whipping cream that I cultured. Yes. Ah! And then what you do, that's, uh, no, they're not ready. They've only been rising maybe 10 minutes. And they're not for them anyway. <laughs> oh, come on. You can't seriously be complaining that I'm not feeding you something. Pizza, pizza. Oh, I do that all the time. I do. <clears throat> Mom was saying, free-form loaves do not rise as well in a warm oven. They don't hold their shape as well. And I cheat a little when I know that I'm making freeform loaves, I put a little bit more flour than I normally would so that the dough is a little stiffer so that it will hold its shape um, on the freeform pan. 
because after working here all day, helping all of you wonderful people start making bread, bread is usually the last thing that I want to do when I get home. So, but that's just the way life goes. And I have committed to feeding my family only this kind of bread. And so for me, I have to do it in the evening. And um, anybody who knows me, we are a very, very active family. All three of my children played sports this fall. But my boys are still playing sports. They're still playing baseball. And um, so last night when we finally, I went straight from work to the ball field. We got home. It was after 9 o'clock last night when we finally got home. And, um, and I was out of bread. So I had to put bread on last night. So I do let my bread rise in a warm oven most of the time. I use extra yeast to make it rise faster so that I don't have to wait so long on it. That, those are all perfectly acceptable things to do. Um, the last thing that I, we, any of us here want to hear five years, two years, ten years down the road is to see you out and about somewhere and you go, oh yeah, I used to grind my own wheat and make my own bread and I used to do all of that stuff, but we just got so busy that I can't do that anymore. That is probably the most discouraging thing for any of us to hear that work here. We really want to try and help you figure out as your family grows, as it changes. You know, kids get older and more stuff starts happening in your house. And, um, you know, if the only way that you can make bread is by adding extra yeast and rising it in a warm oven so it doesn't take so long, then let's do it. Don't stop doing it altogether because you thought that the only way to make bread was making 10 loaves at a time like you used to when all your kids were still little and you were at home because who in their right mind would load up that many kids and take them out of the house, right? Um, when you were at home, I'm speaking from experience, we didn't go anywhere when I was little. No way, Jose. Have you met my brothers? Mm -mm, no, you didn't take them out in public. No, no. You just fed them bread, go outside and run around the house 10 times. Do you remember that? I so, I so used that punishment on one of my boys the other day. He just would not sit still. And I said, go run around the house 10 times, 10 times, run around the house and come back when you're done. Um, yeah. So there is our butter. Did you see how I was working it and pressing the buttermilk off and pouring it into here? And then here is our, here's our buttermilk. Now you could certainly use that buttermilk in your, you know, muffins or to bake with or whatever you want. Um, and then, of course, you can use it to, to reculture. Um, now, this was third generation cream, and so is this now. And I actually have, I did put on bread earlier. It's out in the store. Hopefully, it hasn't been too busy up there that the customers haven't all eaten it. But that butter is going to go out in the store with the fresh bread and y'all are welcome to try that as you guys leave. Let's ice the cake really quick and then we'll say goodbye to the um, to the internet friends that we have going on and then I will cut and serve pizza for you guys. They don't need to, oh, oh yes, please sh go ahead, show them. I forgot that we carry that now. Oh, okay, yes. So what this is, um, obviously for the nonstick pans, you can't use a pizza cutter on them. So this is a, what is it? Is it called a pizza scissor? Yeah, pizza scissors for you to cut your pizza and it's, pla it's plastic here so that it won't scratch your pizza pan. This one and this one though, um, don't cut all the way through. Okay. I'm gonna take them off because I don't wanna contaminate cheese onto the section that we have a non-dairy. See, I did think of you. So you think of these things when you actually have someone who can't, you can't like use the same cutting utensils on stuff. Okay. All right, we'll figure it out. But isn't that nice? And then you can totally cut them how you want. All right, so let's get the, um, oh yeah, great stocking stuffer. Okay. 
If you want to just take the pizza over to there, that'll be great. All right. Now, our icing has have obviously had plenty of time to dissolve. But we're just going to re-blend it. All right. And then you know the trick for cakes, right? Put the, um, put the, the when you're doing layered cakes like this, <clears throat> you're going to put the, the first, the bottom layer down just like it sat in the pan. So that nice flat, put it on the bottom, okay? Now, if I wanted to pipe this icing, I would put it in, it's so hot up here, let me just tell you, with these ovens going, I'm sure you guys are nice and warm. I am about to roast. Um, so if I was going to pipe this icing, I would put it in the refrigerator and let it get completely thick again. But huh, it's totally going to eat really, really good anyway. So we're just going to go with it here. And when you're icing a layer cake, you're going to put all your icing for this middle layer is going to go in the very middle. And then you're going to work it out. That'll keep it nice and pretty. Also, you can refrigerate your cake before you start icing it. Um, you can actually put a very, very thin layer of icing and then refrigerate it. And that will seal it in so that it won't get all crumbly and you won't get all the crumb mess in your icing. But this also helps by putting the big blob of icing in the middle of your cake and then working it out. You could certainly put berries here, raspberries and strawberries fresh if you wanted to. Okay, then <clears throat> what you do for the top layer is this was the top of the cake. You know, this was obviously the bottom that was in the pan. You put the bottom pan part up. That, mean, that makes sure that you have a nice level. So you have level on the bottom and nice and level on the top. I know, the first time I realized that, I was like, why didn't I think of that sooner? Does that make sense? So you're actually putting top to top, right side to right side, if you're thinking in a sewing, sewing terminology. <clears throat> so top of the cake to the top of the cake so that the bottoms of the pans are what's on the bottom of your cake stand and what's now standing face up like this. Okay. Now, obviously with the top, you've got to put more because you're about to go down the sides. But what I have found is if you just kind of work from the center, isn't that gorgeous though? Like I said, this is very, very runny icing today because it's been sitting back here next to my ovens. Um, if you stuck this, and there's a nice little clump of cream cheese. If you stuck this icing into your refrigerator, it would get nice and firm and you would be able to put it into a piping bag. Um, you could certainly color it with food coloring if you wanted to. Obviously, chocolate icing, you would just add some cocoa to it when you mixed it up. But just let it kind of fall over the sides. Let gravity help you out. I am definitely not the cake decorator in the family. That would be my Aunt Karen, who is working out in the store, who we have tried to convince her to teach a cake decorating class. She is the cake making expert. She is the resident wedding cake maker for our family. And then my sister-in-law, Amanda, she is the cupcake queen absolutely the cupcake queen and she won't get on camera either so you are stuck with me there you go 
You could certainly top it with shaved chocolate or fruit or whatever you want to do. Um, so we are going to, we're serving the pizza. We're going to cut and serve the cake. Um, one tool that I do want to show you is um, the My Favorite Knife <clears throat> is um, a wonderful cake cutter as well. Cake or pie. Um, the USA line of bakeware has a pie pan, so this is great to use in, um, when cutting your pies. Um, also, another great tool for cutting pies and cakes and brownies is a plastic knife. Just the white disposable plastic knives. It doesn't stick all of the fat that's in brownie recipes and things like that. It won't stick to those plastic knives. So that's those types of things actually work better um, to cut cakes and brownies and things like that. Um, I think we got to everything. I can't believe it. We made everything. So I hope you guys enjoyed the class. Obviously, you guys can ask as many questions as you want to, but we are going to sign off to all of the online people. <laughs>